So we, uh, have a, a fairly good list. So I'll, uh, introduce Dr. Costain and we can get started. I think this is a presentation on our list. Thank you, Bill. Um, everything that I, that I will talk about is already online and uh, you can <coughs> access it from any one of these three um, URLs. Um, and the reports all look like this to the Department of Energy. Mostly. And I'd like to acknowledge the people that were on this project from 1977 to 1982. Um, and I outlined three of them. There are only three people that survived the entire period from day one to the uh, end of the project. And that was Alex Spear and Lou Glover and me. And, um, Twenty of those people were members of a full-time seismic crew. We did. Uh, there were three uh, drilling operations. Um, we had our own drill of the lab for drilling thousand foot holes in the Piedmont in Corin. Um, then uh, here's a something we took near. Uh, C25, that all confirmed the radiogenic model. And then um, we had another going program that was under contract to Rui Festival for about 50 1,000 holes in the coastal plain settlements. And then finally, we chose a deep drill site. Um, and the one we chose was uh, at Crystal Maryland. Okay, but I would like to start in New England. And the uh, reason for that is uh, way back in 1968, Francis Birch of Harvard made a rather astounding discovery, it seemed to us. He went out and drilled holes and took the core from the holes and ground it up and determined uh, with the gamma ray spectrometer the uranium chloride potassium contents, and that was heat production. And then he also measured the heat flow in the hole by measuring the geothermal gradient and multiplying that by thermal conductivity. And then he plotted the heat production against the uh, heat flow. Uh, and what he found was really astounding. These are some of the sites that he looked at. New York. Uh, um, he found a straight line. Uh, here's heat production and here's heat flow. And the interpretation is that this much heat comes from uranium carbon potassium and then this much heat from here to here comes from the uh, um, lower crust and upper mid. Um, the big question was what is the distribution of uranium chlorine and potassium in the crust? Um, and uh, here are some of the values of, uh, uh, I don't know whether you can see those numbers or not, or not for uranium TPM 15. Uh, they were the point is that he had high heat flow values in uh, New England, but no coastal plain sediments. On the other hand, we had coastal plain sediments, and we knew we had heat producing glucons. So if we could put the two together, uh, then we would have a blanketing effect of the sediments on top of these heat producing glucons. The question is, what does this mean? Um, and Birch thought the simplest model was the best, 
that you simply have a certain heat production at the surface and you go down to some depth of Z, like say eight kilometers. Um, and uh, and that was it. So A0 here, no matter where you drill a hole here, you get the same heat production. And that extends, for some reason, down to a kilometer. And that would give you this. Um, then Leidenberg with the USGS, the same year, came out with an alternate explanation. He said, well, if the <coughs> distribution of heat producing elements exponentially decreases with depth, then you still get a straight line. Um, and then I got in the act in 1980 and said, well, if you have a decode line that cuts off an exponential distribution, then you still get a straight line. And so, to this day, as far as I know, we still don't know which is correct. But um, the reason it's important is because if you observe this linear relation in an area, then you can uh, determine the temperature as a function of depth. And that's why it's important. And that's what we did. And this is our model. Um, these plums are putting uh, the uh, Here's the first one, Pluton, for example, and this is the one off to the side. And um, uh, they come in different sizes. Uh, for example, the one beneath the uh, um, Chesky Bay is probably uh, a Vapolis, similar to the one inside, at least in North Carolina, the Rollsville. Um, and uh, so what we were hoping for is the uh, heat producing advantages of the ones in New England combined with our blanketing thing. Um, and so we were off looking for these and we started looking for the ones that are exposed. Now these plutons didn't all make it up to the same crustal level and some of them just uh, froze um, deeper. And the only signature that they would have would be, for example, gravity and uh, possibly heat flux. You could get a heat flux. Some examples of this one would be Smith Point, Virginia, Chesky Bay, Crisfield, Merrick, uh, Maryland, Lumberton, and Stumpy Point, North Carolina. It's a really interesting location. Okay. And so with the uh, linear relationship and the blanking effect, then you can see that um, we can compute we can compute the temperature versus depth down to several kilometers. And if we don't have any heat producing sediments, then you get this line, not very exciting, 100 degrees here, this is depth two point five And if you have uh, plenty of heat uh, heat producing good, then um, that's a lot better. But look what happens if you add insulating low thermal conductivity uh, sediments on top of the, the heat producing ground, then you get very nice temperatures. Um, so that makes it a sweater effect. So you essentially like it some so the criteria for the drill site selections were, one, uh, we would like a high concentration of heat producing isotopes of uranium and thorium. Uh, uranium and thorium contribute to roughly 40% each, and then the other 20%, 15, 20% comes from potassium. And the thickness of the sedimentary layer, um, the thermal conductivity of the sedimentary insulator, and the thickness of the sedimentary insulator, and then the reservoir conditions in the permeable uh, sedimentary rocks overlying the radiogenic heat source. So after all is said and done, will this really work? I mean, can we really 
punch two holes down in coastal plain sediments and set up a pair of wells, one to inject and one to um, uh, pump. And can we maintain a thermal resource? And I was curious about this from the beginning. And so one of my students, Randy Lasniak, who uh, retired recently from the USGS, I believe. He worked uh, in Yakima for, for most of his career. Uh, did a model study of that, and I'll show you some of his results. Okay, well, um, quickly to go through these. Uh, New Jersey, we had uh, the, can you see these numbers? This is 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22. And these are the holes that were covered in Jersey down to about, these are 300 meters, so these are 1,000 foot holes. And the 1,000 feet, um, we get these temperatures. In Delaware, um, we have holes to the ear. And, um, and got the uh, similar temperatures here. I can't see those numbers from here, but uh, they're all kind of pretty much the same. In Maryland, um, all of the Maryland wells are plotted on this graph. And of course, the objective of this whole program was to determine the highest temperatures at the shallowest steps. And this was uh, found to be at Crisfield. Skipping for the time being the point. And so uh, that was where the third drilling operation took place at Crisfield in Europe in 1979. Uh, and um, down to uh, uh, 1600, uh, 1700 feet, where we get. Uh, not a granite, but the heat flow was high, and uh, so that particular uh, granite, part of the baffleth underside underlies Chesapeake Bay, was not exposed. In Virginia and Maryland, these are um, the co-locations, and um, okay, that's better. Uh, so at uh, at Crisfield, we had uh, 1,500 meters, about 60 degrees centigrade. So then uh, we were out looking for, uh, to try to understand these uh, heat producing granites. And it turns out that Alex Spear um, uh, was the uh, lead petrologist on this program. And they're all different. I was hoping Alex would be here today to say something about these, but these are some of the ones that we drilled. <clears throat> For example, uh, um, the, uh, the temperature gradient at Smith Island in Maryland is, oh, that's 41 degrees. <laughs> that's pretty good. And that is associated with a negative gravity modeling. Um, the Petersburg granite is too, and um, so is the Portsmouth anomaly and the Dorset anomaly. And you would think, well, if this is the Petersburg anomaly right here, then uh, Dorset must be a very similar kind of rock, but it isn't. Um, Alex discovered that they're quite different. Uh, Dort and, uh, and the Portsmouth actually have about the same geothermal gradient, uh, 23 degrees centigrade per pound. That's in the brain. Okay, so these granites, they cluster about um, 300 million years. They're about uh, the post metamorphic ones. They're about uh, 265 to 330 million years um, before the intrusion of the Mesozoic dynamic dikes. They crop out in every major lithologic structure belt of the Piedmont. 
Um, they range in size from small stocks to batholith proportions. And most of the heat is produced by uranium and thorium. Um, and uh, they post-state the last region metamorphism. And one thing that we discovered early on is that the fine-grained facies of these granites are just about twice as uh, the heat production of the coarse grain, as demonstrated here by Ruby Hill. The heat production of the fine-grained facies is uh, just about twice that of the coarse grain. And here's a histogram of uh, the uranium elemental uh, heat parts from in uranium part from Alex Spear. Okay. Well, the radiogenic model was confirmed here at um, Portsmouth. And we drilled uh, two holes. We drilled one at C25, which is uh, this one. That was drilled into the middle of the negative gravity anomaly. And then just to compare the results from this one, we drilled another one at Isle of Wight at C26. And uh, that was in metamorphic basement. And we wanted to compare the heat flow and the geothermal gradients from these holes to confirm really that the uh, the model worked, and that's the result on the right hand side. But we have um, higher gradients above C25, the Portsmouth granite, the red one, and, uh, as opposed to the uh, gradient in C26, the blue. Um, here's. Oh, by the way, and Billy has provided um, printouts of uh, Alex Beer's write-up of C25 or C20, C25, and Richard Gleason's write-up of C26 for the basement rock. And these are the rocks that are on the table um, in the rear of the room. I think if you want to look at those later. Okay, well, um, in uh, North Carolina, we drilled quite a few. And uh, one of them was at Stubby Point at C19. And um, we, we were able to get a small amount of core. I don't know, I think it was maybe four feet from the basement of that hole. And it had the highest heat generation of anything that we came across. And so this is the highest heat flow that we found so far in the southeast United States. Um, but the interesting thing about the core was that um, it was pre-Cambrian, whereas all of these other ones are between 270 and 330 years, roughly. And here's one that's a million years old. So uh, we don't know what this, what this means. Uh, it's all covered by Atlantic coastal plains. But this particular um, granite is not one of our granites. That is to say, it's not one of the ones that we expected to find. So if anybody has any comments about where this came from, they'd be much appreciated. The core, by the way, we only had four feet. And um, so that means we had to take temperature measurements at very close intervals and thermal conductivity determinations at very close intervals uh, in order to get um, a good heat flow value, which we did. So I don't know whether you can see this, uh, but we're getting <coughs> um, we're getting uh, values up around 50, 55 degrees for the geothermal gradient, the blue line. Um, and uh, this, so, Tony Point 
is an anomaly and an interesting one with a high heat flow and high heat production. Okay, one thing though that you have to be careful about is that with the Atlantic Coastal Plain sediments, you can't take really a shallow 1,000 foot hole and expect to be able to produce, to project that to um, depth. Because the sediments compact. And when they compact, the thermal conductivity increases. And if the thermal conductivity increases, then the temperature decreases. And so if you project a temperature from the surface down to a very deep depth, then you're going to be too high in temperature. Maybe how much? Well, I don't know. Ballpark 15 percent. Okay, South Carolina, um, uh, some of our, uh, our food on yes, we had uh, Liberty Hill and Kershaw and uh, and Cuffey Town Creek, which is Edgefield, ED1. Um, and then we did have an opportunity to, to log the holes at the Savannah River site. And um, um, one really interesting thing there, which is relevant to geothermal energy in, in a way, is that these fractures can be correlated across the site. Here's the site, and lots of holes at the Savannah River site. And um, you can actually log each one of these holes, which I did, and uh, and you can correlate where the water is flowing in the holes just by looking at the temperature log, a temperature gradient log. I mean, so this log right here is the gradient and this is the temperature. And uh, this, I think, points out the real utility of temperature logs that I'm not sure that is fully appreciated. But um, it's possibly the best way to find those fractures with water that's flowing through them. Uh, and this means better than a flow meter. But you have to be very precise uh, to a thousandth of a degree in your in measurements. And most people in heat flow uh, have that kind of precision. But I don't think it's shared by industry. I think industry may be five degrees, not a thousandth. Okay, in Georgia, we had a nice deep one at 2,000 um, meters, and uh, thanks to industry and uh, temperature of about 50 degrees centigrade here. And then uh, we had pretty much the same gradient for Kings Bay, which is clear across the state here. All of these little red lines are seismic lines. Well, we also looked at hot springs and um, in the Warm Springs Annie Plant in Bath County and uh, in collaboration with Peter Geiser, a structural geologist, uh, we mapped that and concluded that the water was flowing down through uh, very quartzose units down to three kilometers and then coming back up as warm springs. So, or said another way, there isn't any still cooling pluton down there. It's simply deep meteoric circulation. So all throughout this uh, project, we found uh, fractures fractures, fractures, everywhere. That core in the back of the room really fractured down to whatever depth you you drill to. Fractures all around. The crust is 
completely fractured, which is good for uh, geothermal energy. Right? Okay, so how long, I was curious about how long, uh, would this really work? Could we uh, do a, uh, am I running over? Not yet, so. okay. Uh, could we really do this? I mean, once we, uh, once we drilled a hole where we took the water out and then circulated it, took the heat out or put the heat in, and put it back in the aquifer, then um, how long is it going to last or how much could we pump? In other words, I wanted to know the credibility of what we were doing. And so, um, Randy Lasniak uh, modeled it and um, we really did take into account the uh, material properties, which I have a slide here, the permeability, temperature gradient, thermal conductivity, density, all that, as well as the fluid properties, which I didn't uh, include. And um, then, in collaboration with Berkeley uh, and um, uh, Lippmann, who wrote a, a Fortran code called CCC, Compaction, Conduction, and Convection, I think it was called. A very sophisticated code in 1982. Um, Randy was able to model that uh, the Crisfield um, scenario. So we used the temperatures and the data that we got from Crisfield and the values of permeability that we got from uh, drill stem tests. And those were never, that's never been published, I don't think. I think Johns Hopkins did those. Uh, and, um, and we came out with these conclusions. But uh, yeah, it really works. Um, <clears throat> we take the water out at 55 degrees centigrade. Then we put it back in at 43 and a half degrees centigrade. But um, the spacing is important. If you have a hundred meter spacing between the pumping and the injection well, then um, you get the breakthrough temperature very quickly, and so the lifetime is not too good. Um, the breakthrough temperature being if the temperature drops one degree, even. So that's not so good. On the other hand, you go up to 250 meters with the spacing, and the Crestfield uh, uh, criteria, and that's a lot better if you pump 100 gallons per minute. If you pump 500 gallons per minute, not bad. Um, if you go up to 1,000 meters, a kilometer spacing, and uh, you pump uh, 100 or 500 meters, uh, that's great. You don't ever have to stop the uh, system. And so uh, 500 gallons per minute with a wide enough uh, spacing is uh, pretty good if 500 gallons per minute is enough. <laughs> that's a lot, it seems to me. Okay, and uh, that's my last slide, really. And um, the thing that impresses me when I look back on this, uh, that was done in uh, 1982, is I've recently been working with this software called Console, and it's finite element modeling software. And let me tell you, uh, Randy and I, and with the help of um, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, spent weeks and months on meshes, designing meshes for this particular problem, and then running the thing on the computer. Uh, nowadays, today, for example, uh, the, what we did back then in weeks and months can be done in less than a second. 
So the, the, uh, the advances are just absolutely phenomenal with what you can do. I'm not even sure CCC code is used anymore because it's been um, replaced by such sophisticated software like console. It's just a delight to use. Anybody here use it? C-O-M-S-O-L. Okay, well, thank you. That's all. Right here, yeah. Were any of these sites that were implemented? No. Actual two no. Uh, no. Uh, it's another case of. It's another example of a uh, uh, a future that was just uh, destroyed by politics. Um. No, maybe there are locations since this is quite a while ago, and I haven't really kept up. I don't, but I don't think any state has has actually done anything like this. But all we did was say, uh, "Okay, this is really feasible. This works. You can do this. You can do this for a school. You can do it for a military base. Look at all the military bases there are in this country." Uh, it's just absolutely incredible if you plot these on a map. And I understand now that they have, uh, they, they're they supposed to have a, uh, a zero carbon footprint. Well, this is one way to go, I think. All those that are on the coastal plain, and there are lots of them. Yeah. My hearing isn't too good, okay? So somebody's going to have to repeat that, or I'm going to have to come over there. Okay. I'll, I'll say it louder. Uh, I'm just curious, um, have you tried to drill at sites where you have plutons that are mantled or covered by existing rocks? Yeah, we have. Uh, you mean by, by coastal plain sediments? Uh, no, by or just by metamorphic rock or uh, no, 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 we have not. That's a good question. Yeah, we, we haven't done that. Um, we we kind of took, uh, this was a five-year program. We kind of took the, uh, the, the obvious ones and, and there's so many of them. The reason for looking for unmetamorphosed plutons because metamorphism was driven off. Of yeah, uranium. metamorphism drives off the uh, uranium and thorium. Okay. And uh, uh, so, if you look in the basement rock, like for example, the. Uh, um, <coughs> the crystalline basement, metamorphose basement, beside the Portsmouth pluton. Then, um, that's metamorphosed and it doesn't have any any uranium and thorium. But then you just go over 10 kilometers and you get uh, the Portsmouth pluton and it does. So, yeah, the metamorphism drives off uranium and thorium. Curious about this tree cambrian. I don't know. Yeah, granite. I know. I, you're right. Uh, that's why is that um, unmetamorphosed? I don't know. Yeah. You said that when you're looking at the coastal plain sediments that because of compaction, <coughs> excuse me, that your temperatures could be off by approximately 15 percent. If you project. If you project down. So my question would be, how about if you got shallow temperatures and say a granitic volume 
crops out of the surface for those who pretty good because of the That's fact. different. Remember that's that? a different, that's different. You bet. In that case, you don't have that problem of compaction. Uh, so you can do, you can project. Have you ever done that, tested that, uh, you know, doing shallow and also doing like a heat? Yeah, to yeah, it then, then you're okay. You, the only thing you have to avoid, what we found was it is absolutely impossible to go to a location like this, some, one place in North Carolina, I think it's 40 Acre Park, does that ring a bell? South Carolina. South Carolina? 40 Acre Rock. 40 Acre, okay. Well, we thought this is a great place to drill a hole. Uh, because, um, look, there's not a blade of grass anywhere in sight. And so we did. We uh, drilled a hole and we got down to about 350 feet. Uh, the drill just dropped out of sight. And uh, it was all weathered and fractured, and we had to abandon that hole, the only one of the entire program that we had to abandon. And that, uh, because, <laughs> how can you tell? So, I think myself that you have to be able to get a thousand foot hole um, before you can get a reliable grading. Some people say 500 feet, but I don't think that's enough. I think uh, the data, the statistics suggest that you really need uh, a thousand feet. That was that's been our experience, anyway. Yes. Uh, going back to the uh, chemistry of these 300 million year old, 270, 300 million, million year old granites. Yeah. <clears throat> specifically, the uranium and thorium. Uh, in the studies that were done, do you have any sense? Uh, as to the mineral host or uranium and thorium. Oh, yes, and yes. And uh, I'd like to refer you to the handouts that are included in your package for that. Because uh, I think uh, Alex Beer discussed that. Um, and offhand, I don't, I don't remember. That's in Spears' description of the granitoid rocks? That would be C25 by Alexander Spear. There was one mention in, in the cases of 25A of the presence of uraninite uh, identified in a thin section. Yeah, but what, what about the rest of them? I don't, I, I, you'd, you'd have to read really those. Yeah, that, that's all documented and uh, yeah, it's, all, it's all online and I'm sorry but I just don't have the answer. I'm sorry. If they're in the zircons and not in the, not in the feldspars, then they can still be retained in terms of the uranium content, regardless of the metamorphism. Yeah. This zircon is not less, doesn't let it out that much. Yeah. So zircon H dating is more reliable. Right? I'm sorry? Uh, age dating with zircons is more reliable. Well, that's the whole premise of geochronology there. Right. Yeah. That the lattice is closed and not released through metamorphism. Yeah. So I'm curious as to where you know where the host of that yeah. those uh, are. Okay. Um, yeah, I I don't uh, really remember which minerals uh, the uranium target. It has been documented, and it's all. But but Alex Spear, but you've done some mineral chemistry on that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I absolutely. mean, presumably it would be, you know, it, it would be the zircons, monazite, the uranium bearing accessory metals. Uh, that would be more prevalent in a lubricantic, you know, fairly evolved uh, English rock like genetic rock like that. So. The, the fact that the uranium concentrations are higher, actually higher than, than I would expect. The, the, one, the, the measurements that are in those publications, you know, they're about nine and close to ten parts per million. It's sort of a, a background concentration. And that that seems a little bit higher than what I've seen in, in other, you know, comparable granitic rocks. 
are post metamorphic but um, I, I'm just assuming that it's contained in those accessory minerals. That have, um, yeah. Yes. Um, I have more of just a comment than a question, but you showed up there earlier in some of your slides that uh, some of the corals are filled up in New Hampshire and Rhode Island. Oh yeah. State geologists up there at the beginning of the Zoom program were looking into some of the um, futons up there. Conway Grant has been right. found as you know, it's a micro That's the micro one. Yeah. Content and I think the testers report from MIT I was looking at you know, right. Zoom. That's one of the ones. Mentioned, but that core hole is one kilometer deep from over 3,000 feet. And although they had projections of temp out of the temperatures, they did not achieve that. And what happened, it was more kind of like a lap of its shape, and they kind of drilled through it, got back into the, right. the uh, yeah. uh, metasedimentary type rocks below that. But I guess the lesson there is <clears throat> looking at these bodies, we can talk about them all we want, but we better get some better three dimensional. Control of right. the shapes of the Yes, device. absolutely. Engineer yeah. this. Now, maybe yeah. Earth skull uh, <clears throat> studies that go through will give us better feel for what the dimensions of yep. the bodies are. Yes. But without that, um, we can talk all we want about these minor chains and heat flow, but got to have yeah. that. Yeah, right. Technology. I agree. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, we, we modeled a few of these with gravity, but um, you're right. You need to know the geometry of the uh, body. Because uh, the uh, linear relationship does assume an infinite slab. <laughs> and a nice mathematical model. But it works. That's the thing. Yeah, it works. And, um, and the slope of that linear relationship, by the way, has the dimensions of length. Uh, it's usually referred to as capital D. And Beneath the Sierra Nevada, where Art Lockenburg made his discovery of the linear relationship, is beautiful. D has a value of 11 kilometers, as I remember. And um, that fit beautifully with the uh, Dacoma model as, as uh, placing a Dacoma under, under the southern Sierra Nevada at a depth of 11 kilometers. Huh. Uh, but, um, and, our, and Ed Decker and I published a paper on that. So, uh, but the, uh, uh, you're right, I mean, we, we, need to, we need to know what the geometry is. And these come in all different sizes and shapes. And the thing that impressed me is that even though these, these plutons uh, and basilis seem to be on a trend, if you look at a map and they're all in a trend, you think, well, they're all the same thing. They aren't. They're all different. They're really strikingly different. Okay, well, thanks. Estimates of the water table elevation in the base flows of the recession. So, for the last year, uh, I've been working with Dr. Costain down at Virginia Tech. And what we've really been trying to do is um, estimate the depth of the water table throughout the state of Virginia um, for use for ground source heat pumps and open loop geothermal wells. Um, so again, the purpose really is for small, smaller scale installations, so um, ideally towards homes is what we're geared towards, so that a homeowner or a driller um, could use this map that we've produced to get a rough idea of where they might find water or the first occurrence of water they might find below the surface. Um, when it is not, it is not a definitive resource, so we're not saying that if you drill to this depth, you will find water and you, that you'll be able to install a well that will produce enough water to um, cool or heat your home with a geothermal installation. 
um, and it is not a replacement for the expertise of a geologist or a driller when installing one of these wells. Um, however, we do think it is very useful and that it's a good starting point for uh, homeowners or drillers. Uh, we've also made an attempt to describe hydraulic diffusivity. Um, and that's really just getting started. There's a lot of work to be done with that aspect of the project. Um, but I will get into that more a little bit later. So here we have just a topographic map of Virginia with an overlay. Uh, each red dot is a stream gauge in Virginia. Um, and they're all operated by the USGS. And we decided to use stream gauges rather than wells because honestly we trust the data a lot more from the stream gauges. Um, there's a lot more consistency in the data and uh, it's more well maintained and we could work with it well. And we had a pretty good geographic distribution. Um, however, there is a lack of resolution so uh, our estimates are somewhat general. Um, and you can also see that there are no stream gauges on the eastern shore. So we've had to leave that out of our study completely. One of the major tools we used when estimating the depth of the water is hydrograph separation, which basically separates base flow from total flow in a stream. Um, total flow is made up of four different components, surface runoff, interflow, <clears throat> precipitation on the stream, and base flow. Um, interflow and precipitation for our purposes are essentially negligible, uh, so we've ignored those. Um, and surface runoff, uh, as you can see in this graph, um, the blue, the high peaks that are blue uh, represent the total flow, whereas the, the much gentler peaks that are purple pink color represent base flow. Um, so base flow essentially is water that is entering a stream from groundwater. So base flow represents all of the water in the stream that is coming from the groundwater. So once we separated base flow from total flow, uh, we know that the, we know the recharge from the groundwater to the stream. So we can use uh, rating tables from the USGS, which they determine empirically at each stream gauge. And what these rating tables are, it's a relationship between the stream flow and the height of the gauge. Uh, so uh, they determine this empirically with stream flow, with flow meters. Um, and there is, some, there is some uncertainty in those measurements because they, they use different meters at different gauges and uh, the meters are susceptible to um, uncertainties because of different flow conditions. Um, so when we looked at base flow, almost all of our values fall below 50,000 CFS. So we're dealing with a very small part of the curve which I'll talk about a little bit later about some of the consistency we found at a lot of the stream gauges in the water table elevation. But um, yeah, again, the USGS determines these empirically and it provides a nice tool for us to estimate, well, to know the height of the stream surface at a stream gauge. And when base flow is equal to total flow, the stream is in base flow recession, so we've extracted the base flow from the hydrograph separation, and we looked for points where the total flow is equivalent to the base flow, and then use that value. We plug it in here, plug in the CFS value, and we get a gauge height. And at that point, that gauge height is the surface of the water table, because all of the flow in the stream is coming from base flow. So all of the stream is coming from groundwater. Uh, one of the more interesting things we found, uh, this is just one example at a stream gauge on the James River, uh, a little bit west of Richmond, is that during base flow recession, if you take the average value, 
throughout the year. So each of these points represents one year from 1902 to 2012. And each point is the average of the base flow, base flow recession elevations from that year. We found that the difference between maximum and minimum elevation at this gauge and all of the other gauges in Virginia was less than a meter. Uh, so during base flow recession, we found that the water table is remarkably consistent throughout the state, and it has been throughout time as well. We thought that was a really remarkable observation. Maybe um, we could have some discussion of this after, but uh, I just uh, I just thought all this talk about overutilization of water and, and this that, and the other thing that, uh, and yet over a hundred years, the water table elevation doesn't change by more than a meter. Hey, I, I think that's. Okay, excuse me, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to have you chime in. Um, one thought we had was that this consistency might also be tied to the connection between the ocean and the water and the crust, um, the relationship between crustal porosity and permeability in the ocean, because ultimately the water table and the level of the streams is controlled by the base level of the ocean. Um, so this is a plot of the James River, each gauge on the James River, starting from the, the most western gauge going to the most eastern gauge. And you can't really see it, but each of these horizontal lines, it's actually two horizontal lines, and it shows the maximum and minimum elevation of the water table at that gauge. And it will be blown up in the next slide so that you can see those differences a little bit better. But um, what we thought was interesting is that in the eastern gauges, in the central Virginia, Virginia seismic zone, there is a slightly higher variability in the water table. And um, that ties into a lot of other work that Dr. Costain is doing uh, relating to hydroseismicity. And we thought that that was just another interesting little find that we came across in the process of trying to map the water table. So this is basically a blow up of each of those horizontal lines. So we see each bar represents one gauge, and the top of the bar is the maximum water table elevation. The zero is zero. So uh, as you can see, again, the final three gauges, uh, which are in the central Virginia seismic, seismic zone, have a slightly greater variability. And it's not much of a variation, but because of the quality of the USGS data, for the stream gauges, we think that there's definitely uh, there are definitely some implications there. Next, we see at the same stream gauge. I've used the same stream gauge throughout this presentation just to be consistent. But uh, this basically shows an average value of the water table elevation during each month for a period of 110 years. So. We took all of the values from January and averaged them together, and we get the point four one. Um, so we plotted them out, and we were again surprised by how nicely the trend came out. And I guess the big takeaway from this for us was that, well, yes, we've shown that the hydrologic cycle is in fact a cycle. Um, So then we plotted a sinusoid to it, and uh, we got a pretty good fit. And we're using that to say that the water table is definitely, well, we can predict it. We could use this method to predict the water table. Um, and that because of the consistency that we saw over 110 years, we think that those predictions will be pretty good. Um, another way to predict the flow and the elevation uh, is to find the base flow recession constant, uh, which there are several methods for doing, but uh, we chose to um, try the method of, well, we found the slope of each of these lines. Uh, long story short. Um, so we attempted to pick out 
these longer trends in each of these graphs and find the slope for that and match it. Um, I don't have the equation in the slide, but essentially the slope of these lines will tell you the base flow, flow recession constant. And with that constant, you can plug in to this um, exponential equation and you can predict the flow at a stream at any time. So if you know the flow one day and you have this recession constant, as long as the stream is in base flow recession, you can predict what the flow will be the next day or a week down the line, a week down the line, assuming that it stays in base flow recession. <clears throat> so here we have a histogram showing um, the value we calculated for the recession constant. And we don't have a previously calculated value at this gauge to compare to, but this uh, calculation is consistent with other recession constants in other places where recession constants have been calculated. So again, uh, there's still more work to be done to really nail that down, but we think that it's a good start and that um, that could be useful for estimating flow and predicting the water table elevation at these stream gauges and at other points throughout the state. So to move into the diffusivity a little bit, um, what we did was plot the riverbed elevation of the James River against distance from Iron Gate, Virginia, um, which is where the James sort of starts. It's at a confluence of two other streams. Uh, so we saw two, once we got out of the valley or out of the Blue Ridge and Piedmont, we see, well, we see two of these large nick points. Uh, this further one down here, this is in Richmond, that's the fall line transition between the Piedmont and the Tidewater. Um, so we weren't as interested with that, but this first snake point here, we had no idea what that was. It just sort of jumped at us. Um, we weren't expecting to see it. So we investigated it a little bit and um, we plotted the, those points A and B from the last slide. We plotted those on a map and this is in the Piedmont, uh, just below the town of Hardware, Virginia, which is just southeast of Scottsville, so not too far from here. But uh, what we saw is the development of these braided channels between the two points. And basically what that means is that the river has become shallower and wider um, coming out of the mountains, and that the river is probably cutting through uh, a harder unit, a highly quartzose unit, and we think that may mean that, well, we think that could lead to the possibility that there is greater recharge in these quartzose units. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, talking to some other people down at Virginia Tech, we learned that those nick points are due to a change in the base level of the ocean, and they move upstream, and basically they get caught in these hard units. So the snake point has been caught here, um, and you can see it in the tributaries as well. If you plot out the tributaries, you can see the same nick point. Um, we also looked at the Rappahannock River, just as a comparison. Uh, it's in a different river basin. And again, we see these large nick points, and there's no specific correlation between the two rivers in, those two, in these two nick points. Uh, but where the Rappahannock has these large nick points, it is also cutting through a highly quartzose unit. So we think there's potential there for further study and to explore maybe a cor some sort of correlation between a highly quartzose unit and uh, greater recharge. So here's our first water table elevation map. So what this is is a map of Virginia pieced together uh, 
hydrologic subbasin by hydrologic subbasin. So we took each gauge from any single basin and made a contour map for each specific um, hydrologic subunit and then pieced it together um, as our first attempt at an elevation map. And you can see the range of elevations goes well from zero at the coast uh, and rises gradually to the west up to elevations of 700 meters. Um, so next we have a continuous map. So basically the same thing as the last map, but instead of contouring basin by basin, we did the whole state as a whole. And um, again, maybe not too surprising, but we thought that it was a good sign that this map turned out pretty similar to the last map. I'll just flash back really quick and you can, you can see the similarity. Um, and there are some places in this map where there are discontinuities, but overall uh, it's a pretty good match with this map. Uh, then we wanted to ex uh, expand our data set a little bit and we created this map which we created from all base flow data rather than just base flow recession. So we looked at our hydrograph separation, took all of the points of base flow rather than just points where total flow is equivalent to base flow, and we used those points to calculate the water table elevation and create another map. And again, uh, the map turned out essentially identical to the other maps. Um, same elevations, everything. I think uh, when we looked, when we did the comparison between the base flow elevations versus the base flow recession elevations, there is an average difference of 0 0.2 meters. Um, so once we had our elevation maps, uh, we started to work on depth maps. So this first map is just a simple subtraction. We took the USGS topographic data, the digital elevation model. And from that, we subtracted our water table elevation map. Um, now, whether or not we can actually have that level of detail when predicting the water table, probably not. But again, we think it's a pretty good start because um, a lot of previous studies have shown that the water table is essentially a subdued image of the water, of topography. So we wanted to integrate the topography into our water table elevation maps um, because, as you know, the, the water table is not a sea below our feet. It's uh, contained in fractures and aquifers, faults, and all kinds of stuff. Um, and so this was a, a further attempt to refine our map. Um, we did a weighted average between the topography and our water table elevation map, and then took that weighted average and subtracted it from the digital elevation model again. So this is uh, made from, it's actually 90% topography, 10% water table. Uh, but what we found when we did spot checks with USGS wells is that this map works better in the west part of the state. So um, in parts of the Piedmont and then the Blue Ridge, Valley Ridge, Appalachian Plateau, it works better than the straight subtraction, whereas the straight subtraction is more appropriate in the tidewater. Um, and we think that's just due to the difference in geology. In the tidewater, you have sandy aquifers dipping to the southeast, and in the Piedmont and west, you have metamorphosed igneous sedimentary rocks, very few sedimentary aquifers. Um, now, one of the big issues that we've come across when we've talked to other people is that uh, and it's something that one of the first things I learned in my hydrogeology class is that if you have two wells, you can't necessarily interpolate between those wells to get the elevation of the water table in between. Um, but we think we may be justified in this study because we're not concerned about um, confined aquifers. We're only concerned about the unconfined aquifer closest to the surface. And that is essentially continuous. Um, however, you still definitely run into problems. 
because if you spot check with walls overall, we we found a wide range of errors, but we can usually get in with within 20 meters of the depth of the water table. Um, and to do that, we looked at continuously modern USGS wells as well as um, uh, just like neighbors' walls and stuff too. And I'm sure some of you who have walls um, can attest to, I don't know, variations in your wall level there. Uh, when we looked at the data from the walls, there is a greater amount of variation in the well, the static water level in walls as opposed to at the rivers. Um, and we think that at the rivers, uh, these, are, these are very stable points that are sort of control points. And with these maps, if you overlay the stream gauges, the closer you get to a stream gauge, the better the estimate will be. Um, and in between, there's a greater amount of variation. Um, so, to summarize, um, we'd really like to con continue with the hydraulic diffusivity study. Um, we've really just gotten started with that, and we think there's potential there um, to do some good work. Um, and I think one of the biggest things that could help us is to have more wells to spot check. Um, we have a giant data set of USGS wells, but once you weed out all of the wells that are tapping confined aquifers or that don't have um, a very long record of measurement or mm -hmm. um, a, very, a very good record, uh, you're left with very few wells. So increasing our data set would definitely be beneficial. Um, and another idea we had for improving the study uh, is to look at our hydrograph separation again. Instead of just looking at base flow, um, start to integrate total flow and do a statistical analysis on the total flow and see if the total flow falls within uh, a range, an acceptable range of gauge heights. Because with our maps, we, we can get within 20 meters, but I mean, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of variation there. So uh, with that level of accuracy, if we look at total flow, if we can increase the data set even more and um, sort of bracket that, uh, then maybe we could have more data points by using the riverbeds of all of the rivers in Virginia rather than just its stream gauges. So if we found that total flow didn't change our water table elevation map very much, then we could use all like, the surface of all of the rivers as, a control, as control points to map the elevation of the water table. Um, so that's something we haven't really looked at, but uh, it's an idea for going forward. Um, and then I just want to thank everyone who made the project possible. So Department of Energy in <coughs> Arizona and DMMME. So that's what we've got so far. So we're definitely open to comments and suggestions and how we can improve and anything that you guys think warrants a second look. So thanks. Question. I would think that you would be consistently underestimating the elevation of the water table if you're just taking the, the elevations of the streams through the interflues, invariably the water table will be higher than the streams. Right. So that might be a next step in trying to predict the, right. uh, the water table in between the streams, which actually seems to be more important for an application like this. I guess that was that was sort of our attempt with the um, trying to integrate the topographic maps as well. But um, yeah, definitely that was something we we don't have control in between the stream gauges, so that's something that we're trying to deal with. Certainly, you always have the constraint of the land surface being the maximum, mm -hmm. and then the stream your estimates on the stream would be a, a lower constraint. Right. So you, right. You might be able to. From your actual well data, come up with a good uh, <laughs> uh, come up with uh, a 
better estimate for what this was here for a would be like no three. Okay. <laughs> One of the uh, things that we kind of get interested in with this uh, Bitcoin was um, that it was associated with Portland. And the whole idea here was to try and find, uh, to see if we could come up with a map of uh, localized groundwater recharge. So we got the end idea. And uh, quartzites, I know in Bath County, in Virginia, are associated with uh, the hot springs because they seem to be the conduits for the water that goes down to the bottom. And I think that's also true of Georgia, that uh, there are quartzites uh, associated with those sorts of things. And so quartzose rocks um, are important in getting the water down. They're fractured, and they have <clears throat> fantastic uh, bedding plane variability. And so we thought the uh, Nick point was a, a really useful um, tool to, to identify areas that um, have different recharge than adjacent areas. <clears throat> For example, if you've ever been rafting down the James River, then the rafting is great when there are quartzite in the river bed. But then uh, when you go a little further, all of a sudden the water gets um, deep and fishing is probably better. I don't know. But uh, at any point, there are two different recharge situations there. So what we were getting at is for geothermal applications, um, try and localize recharge and try and and uh, when, where is the next big installation, geothermal installation going that needs um, good groundwater communication? And I, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at that um, document that uh, um, Arlene sent uh, last night. It's in your email or in your iPhone. And I think if I read that right, then 78% of all of the uh, ground uh, geothermal installations were using a vertical um, pole. So that means that surely where the groundwater table is is important, right? And how much in there is past that um, hole is important. And that uh, will affect the lifetime of the uh, resource. So anyhow, that's kind of what, what's in the back of our minds about uh, the nick point is associated with the quartzites. And this is not a moving nick point. It's there for millions of years, whereas some of them are actually migrate upstream. I was also going to mention Greg Hancock and William and Mary had actually identified that same thing for us and had the agency was working on it several years ago. In fact, we have a geologic map built in file report that's of the hardware area that you listed. Oh, looking at that. Yeah, 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 right. Did you look at stream gauge flows above the flows at this point to see if it's moving or gaining? Yeah. Confirm or disprove your recharge theory. For example, the USGS has their stream stat software, which is a regression of stream flow in the point click in some places, and get estimates of flow along the stream okay. way, and then you see that it's gone down, and maybe it is recharging there, and then another place in eastern Kentucky, where the Kentucky River flows, and all of a sudden it drops off and gets into yeah. the sandstone areas where it's actually recharging, I think, yeah. you know, those sandstones, and then it picks yeah. up again down below. Yeah, we haven't done that. That's a so maybe uh, look at the difference as you go down the, uh, the uh, stream gauges. Yeah. We have a good idea. I'm just curious to know um, what parameter you use to separate out base flow from home flow. 
So hydrograph separation is, um, it, it, we used a software package called what, a web-based hydrograph analysis tool, which is maintained and operated by Purdue University. Um, and basically, like, it's, it's based on the base flow index value, which is a ratio of the base flow and total flow. And that was determined by uh, David Wallach from USGS. Um, so we didn't do a lot with um, trying to create our own hydrograph separation, but um, we sort of just used the tools that were already available. Yeah, by the way, the assumption, of course, is that base flow is equal to recharge. So if we do a base flow separation, then we also have, we know what the recharge is. All right. Thanks. Okay, Wendy is up next. She's been working very hard on a number of derivative work products based upon the data that we have been supplying as part of the Yes, and uh, she's got some very interesting results that are in a, a preliminary stage. Okay, so I apologize in advance if I go over time, but I've got a lot of cool stuff to talk about. Um, so for this talk, I just want to focus on the next steps, basically. Um, so we've spent all this time collecting this huge data set for all of our states. And as I said yesterday, I wanted to use Virginia as a guinea pig to kind of look into what we can do with the data. Not only can we give it to other people through the NGDS, but perhaps we could use it ourselves to produce some tools that might be useful for research, academia, our own work, um, as well as industry, perhaps. So we came up with a handful of ideas for derivative tools, um, including a water well database for ourselves, a depth to bedrock map, the depth to water map that the Virginia Tech uh, group was working on, just a map showing all the different heat pump installations that we have, um, and then temperature at depth and a heat flow map. So I just want to hit each one of these. So with the joining of a Virginia DEQ water well database and our own data that we compiled for the NGDS, we were able to produce um, a GIS database of over 40,000 water wells across the state. And each one of these wells has a whole bunch of attribute data. So this is really a, a great resource for us. And it's a dynamic resource. It's one that um, we can go into and modify, update, and change. It'd be nice if we had an easier way to do that. Um, but of course, this uh, GIS map is tied to an Excel database that we can go into and modify. So this is great because we have lots of customers who call and ask about wells. Um, and we can just open this right up and take a look. and select wells within a certain location and pull their attribute data. So this is a really useful tool that we produced um, during year two. From that water well database, we had many wells within the database, um, over 5,000 that have depth to bedrock in there. So hopefully Again, whoever went out and drilled the well took note of where, where, where they hit bedrock. And so for all of those points, we were able to produce a map that just shows uh, each one of these point locations for these wells weighted by color based on depth to bedrock. And you can see there's some red points in here. Here's our legend. Um, I chose colors based on depths that I felt may be important for industry. So the first one is, is a depth to bedrock 
um, zero to four feet. So for installing a ground source heat pump, um, like a trench system, you want to be at least four feet. So if you're four feet or shallower, it's really not, not a good scenario. You want to be hopefully six foot deep or deeper. And so the red dots in here show you areas that perhaps aren't, aren't perfect point locations. And then the next grouping is four to 10 feet, 10 to 30 feet, 30 to 50, 50 to 100, and then everything over 100 feet, which for these wells goes up to 2,240 feet. Now this is kind of fun because we can take these depths and correlate them perhaps with other attributes, including soils, soil types across the state, the topography in general, the geology itself, and also just the provinces and see if there are any trends. So we went ahead and decided to look at the general depth to bedrock based on provinces across our state. And we just made these box plots. And you can see that there does tend to be a trend. Specifically in the coastal plain, you have much more variability in your depth to bedrock. And in general, most, most of the depth to bedrock from these wells that we have um, are, are deeper than, for example, the wells that we have in the Appalachian Plateau. So these box plots allow you to kind of see a, a trend if it exists. Then we also took a closer look at each one of the provinces themselves and um, plotted up the depth to bedrock for the counties um, based on each well, based on the wells within that county. And so I think this is a trend going south to north over here. Um, and so here are all the counties plotted up and their um, depth to bedrock. And so this is depth in feet, sorry. And so same thing for the Piedmont province, last thing we saw was the coastal plain. We have many more wells here with depth to bedrock listed. And then Blue Ridge, same thing for each one of our counties. Valley and Ridge. So hopefully this is a good tool for people going out installing systems to refer to, to give them a general idea of um, the likely depth to bedrock for that area. And then same, we have fewer wells uh, Fewer counties within the Appalachian Plateau, and so here are general data. This was kind of a fun, fun thing to do for our states, for our state. So that's our depth to bedrock data, and all of this will be available online, hopefully through our DGMAR website. Then we move to heat pump installations. And we developed a map here that just has each county weighted by color based on the number of installations that we found um, per county. The darker colors over here um, are number of installations greater than 70 to 100. And um, we thought maybe we could see some kind of trend if we correlated that um, with some other attributes. By the way, this all of the heat pump installations were uh, obtained from rebates, any records on rebates. Um, of course, those rebates, we didn't have exact coordinates. All we knew were, were county locations. We also communicated with school systems for each county to see if any schools had geothermal systems installed, and then direct contact with some of the companies that are installing systems. So this is not a completely comprehensive uh, number of installations. I'm sure there are thousands and thousands and thousands more, as Jim was mentioning yesterday. And so we just really need to tap into that resource and figure out exactly where those installations are located. But this, again, gives us some kind of an idea of what we have in Virginia. And so we can correlate this with perhaps population density, which is something I did. I didn't add the map here, but there is definitely a correlation between number of installation and population density for some of these counties. But in some instances, for some of these counties, that's not the case. So perhaps there are some other parallels, including perhaps um, household income, um, maybe also the proximity to companies that do actually install geothermal ground source heat pumps. And so I think this is a, a good baseline to go from if you can plot up the number of installations across your state 
maybe you can see some other trends that exist. So next we're going to move to depth of water, which we just had a wonderful talk about. And um, so Virginia Tech team took some time to take a look at depth of water, which is another element that's very important for a company that's going out and installing ground source heat pump. In addition to depth to bedrock, those are probably the two most important things that they really want to know. And so hopefully these maps, this one is just the uh, water table elevation for base flow. Hopefully these maps will also be available as potentially useful tools for those um, companies. Okay, so now to get into the meat of it, we also decided to make temperature at depth maps for Virginia. And this is uh, Southern Methodist University from uh, Texas, their uh, heat flow map that they put out in 2010, I believe. And so the, the idea is that we can, per, we can take temperature at depth and make multiple slices going further and further down underground and um, plot up basically what temperatures we've measured um, in all the deepest wells that we have across our state. So we decided to focus first on southwest Virginia since that's where we have the greatest data density. That's where all of our oil and gas wells are. That's where the deepest wells are located. So it seemed like the low-hanging fruit that we wanted to address first. And then after we completed that, depending on how successful it was and the methodology we chose, uh, we could expand our study area to encompass the entire state. So let's zoom in on Southwest Virginia here. Um, I mentioned yesterday that we've been using the DGO gas and oil um, database to pull all of our oil and gas well logs. It's a huge, huge database. There are many, many, many thousands of, of wells, and we've only been able to address a small percentage of those in total. Um, so the number of temperature logs specifically that we found from gas and oil wells from this database that were of decent enough quality to use um, in the time that we had were numbered about 230-ish. And that number has altered based on various different um, iterations of this, this attempt. But from those wells, we were able to take about 13 different depth slices based on sea level and map out temperature. So here's our distribution of our data. Um, you'll notice that there's this one green point here. This is our control well, essentially. This is um, John Costain's geothermal test well. It's the ICC, Van Sant, Big A, I believe, uh, geothermal test well. And so that's a good way to double check our temperatures for all these other oil and gas wells in southwest Virginia. Testing, testing. So here are all the temperature values. So we took all of the temperature logs for those wells and plotted them up. And after identifying poor quality logs, removing out that data, this is kind of what we ended up with. Now this looks pretty good. So this is temperature in, in Celsius, and down here on the y-axis we have depth in meters. So these are just the raw temperature values. So essentially where those depth slices intersected each one of the temperature logs. We just extracted that temperature value from each one of the temperature logs and plotted them up here. But you'll notice that there are still some outliers over here and over here. Um, what we noticed is that a lot of these outliers came from the same well logs. So basically the gradient was a decent gradient for that temperature log. Um, so they, all these points basically belong to the same, same well. And so a lot of these outliers, it's the same situation. It's the same, same well, so a handful of wells in particular that we wanted to deal with because they're these outlier data, data. So we decided since the gradients of these logs look perfectly fine, that it was most likely that these Temperature values were either 5, 10 degrees too high or too low just because the equipment hadn't been calibrated, perhaps. 
So maybe it had more to do with equipment than accuracy um, of the, the temperature recording itself. So we decided to identify each one of these logs that were outlier logs and simply shift them over, smooth them by adding or subtracting a certain number of degrees to kind of pull them more into the mainstream general uh, temperature range. So now our temperatures have been smoothed a little bit and they look a lot better. But again, these are raw temperature values. So typically when you go out and drill a well, you're going to log it pretty much immediately after it's drilled. So when you go out and drill the well itself, if you want to extract temperature, uh, measure temperature down hole, it's really not the best time to measure immediately after you've drilled the hole because you've kind of upset the thermal equilibrium by the drilling process, by pumping fluids, um, circulating fluids in to cool the bit as you're drilling. But because there just isn't much time or money, um, these holes are logged immediately after they're drilled. So the temperatures that are recorded aren't in thermal equilibrium. So that means that these raw temperature values you see back here in blue must have some sort of correction applied to them to um, correct for that thermal equilibrium. Now in Southwest Virginia, um, our logs, our well logs are a variety of different quality and sometimes in most cases, they don't note the time since circulation. Um, they don't always note what circulation fluid was used. Sometimes they just say air. Sometimes they say soap or foam or some other magical combination of liquid that was pumped down hole. So we had to kind of generalize and assume um, that all of our wells needed some sort of correction and to apply the same correction to all of them across the board. We chose to use a correction called the Harrison uh, correction that was uh, calculated in 1983. And this correction, um, there are many different corrections to correct for thermal equilibrium. This one didn't require as much information as some of the other corrections. Because we were limited by our attribute data for a lot of these wells, we didn't know time since circulation. A lot of the other corrections that existed out there we couldn't use because we just couldn't complete the calculation. But the Harrison correction seemed like a good one to use. Um, it's based on a, a model from Oklahoma. And as you can see behind here, the correction just basically acts to um, steepen the gradient. So it bumps temperatures at depth a little bit warmer and it cools them in the shallows uh, to correct for that circulation fluid. Okay, so now we have our across the board Harrison correction, but you can tell that this correction isn't quite doing the best job. Up here in the shallow, shallower than um, a thousand meters, the temperatures appear too cold. And we know this from two different controls. One, uh, we can use simply the mean annual air temperature for the surface, which is going to be about 12 degrees C for Southwest Virginia. And so that would mean that our points should uh, plot up right about here. And you can see that that's not the case. Our second control is this black line here, which is John Costain's Virginia Tech ICC well that one I pointed out on the earlier slide. So this is the ideal because it's a geothermal test well, which means John allowed enough time between drilling and logging for the well to attain thermal equilibrium. So this needs no correction, this black line. So this is what we should be seeing by our correction. So you can see the raw data doesn't match up very well with our control ICC well, but neither does our, our Harrison corrected data. So we decided to smooth the Harrison correction based on um, our local known gradient as we see from our ICC law. And so now these green points in here are the Harrison corrected points that have been modified. Essentially what I did is taper off the weight of the Harrison correction going from a thousand meters depth up towards the surface based on the gradient from the ICC well and knowing that they should intersect somewhere close to the mean annual air temperature. Okay, 
So this is what we end up with. Now you'll notice there's a slight bend here, and that's because from 1,000 meters and below, it's 100% Harrison correction for thermal equilibrium. From 1,000 meters and above, it's the tapered Harrison. So that means that at around 1,000 meters, 100% Harrison correction was applied, and it tapers off to uh, about 50% um, up here at the surface. Okay, but in general, I think this data set looks a lot better than it did to begin with. All right, so that means that all of our data that we're using for our temperature depth maps give us a pretty decent gradient. So if we just quickly calculate, we've got 10 degrees up here, 60 degrees over here, going from a depth of 0 to 2,000 meters, that gives us um, about a gradient of 25 degrees C per kilometer. It happens to be 20 degrees up here at the tapered and 30 degrees down here at the 100% correction. So that might be something that we address later. We might decide that this also needs to be tapered off down here deeper than 1,000 meters, which would um, kind of bring, this, bring this, these temperatures down just a little bit. All right, so we have all our data. It's cleaned up. It's corrected. Now, if we take all of these temperature values and we um, correct them for elevation, then they all plot on these 13 different depth slices. So here is sea level. And so each of these temperature values we uh, put onto a map. And that gave us something like this. Um, this is our, our top depth slice. It's at 2,000 feet above sea level. And so all the little black points in here are the wells that have temperature logs that are contributing to this um, temperature map. So these are just temperature maps. They're not heat flow maps. And we used Kingdom software and Surfer to grid the data and create a nice contoured surface. Again, this is temperature in degrees C. And so each slice uh, changes in depth. I know I've got centigrade here and then I have feet over here. Sorry about that. But each depth slice switches, goes from uh, a 50, 500 foot interval. So as we go through these slices, we're going down in depth about 500 feet for Southwest Virginia. And so we went through a couple different stages of this. Um, we made some maps and then noticed there were bullseyes in some of those maps and then we identified what wells were causing the bullseyes and figured out that some of those wells just had poor quality logs or we didn't want to trust them and so we removed some of the bullseyes and this is basically the cleanest set that we've produced so far. And so we've gone through all of our slices down to 2,000 feet, or sorry, down to 4,000 4, feet below sea level is our deepest, um, deepest slice. And so you can see that at that depth, there aren't as many wells that are contributing data. So these are our temperature depth slice, slices that we'd like to put, make available online and um, something that I think um, the other states could potentially do if you have enough uh, temperature data from your wells that, that are deep enough. So again, these are temperature slices from measured temperatures. We didn't project temperature at all. We just used temperature logs that we thought were trustworthy. OK, so we've made our slices for Southwest Virginia. They're really cool. Now um, maybe we could try to do the same thing for the entire state. So we stood back and looked at all the different wells that could potentially contribute to um, a temperature map across the state. And um, about 132 of those total um, intersected with a depth slice that was 600 feet below the surface. So we had to pick a depth. Um, we, we didn't use based on sea level because there's so much topographic uh, variability across the state. We figured going from measured surface depth would hit the most wells, the most temperature logs. And so we decided that 600 feet below the ground surface was our best bet. And so here's our distribution of data points for the entire state. These, of course, are the wells that contributed to those temperature depth slices I showed you earlier. And then we have a smattering of other wells 
uh, predominantly geothermal test wells for the remaining area of the state. And this is what we have for our 600 foot depth temperature map statewide. Um, again, this is in degree C. Um, you see a lot of clustering over here, mainly because there's just a greater concentration of data. Um, also, a lot of this black is from just the point locations for each one of the wells, so it's kind of difficult to see. Um, but it's kind of interesting to see this temperature at depth. Contour interval is one degree. And again, this is at 600 feet measured depth from the ground surface. So we were only able to produce one slice for the entire state. Okay, so now really diving into the meat of things, uh, we wanted to see if we could produce a heat flow map from that temperature data. So this map that's shaded in the background that I've used for a handful of slides is from Southern Methodist University's 2010, I believe, heat flow map. And of course, all of our states are highlighted over here. Typical heat flows, uh, heat flow for eastern states in general usually ranges um, 45 to 55 megawatts per square meter, again, based on the 2011 SMU heat flow map. So we have some kind of idea of what we want to aim for. And in order to get our heat flow, it's a simple calculation. Heat flow is just thermal conductivity, how easily material can conduct heat in watts per meter Kelvin, multiplied by the thermal, grad thermal gradient, which is just, oops, that's shifted, the uh, amount of temperature change per change in depth. So for heat flow, because we have so many more data points in Southwest Virginia, again, that's our focus. Um, we'll see if we can do a statewide map as well, but we're still working on our Southwest Virginia map. Again, here are the total points that we're using for that heat flow map, and of course, still using the control the ICC well, geothermal test well. So at this point, we have about 272 total wells. Again, that number is shifting around um, for the entire state. And the best ones for Southwest Virginia that we currently have are about 230. So again, these are not just wells that have a bottom hole temperature measurement. These are wells that have a complete temperature log that looks decent. OK, so let's calculate heat flow. In order to do that, we had to calculate thermal conductivity first. And the way to do that was first to look at each one of these wells that we're using that has a temperature log and figure out what the lithology is downhole. So that means that hopefully not only do these wells have a nice temperature log, but they also have a lithology log of some kind. Most of them did, some of them didn't, and so we had to interpolate using cross-sections and publications and um, various other uh, items to help us figure those out. So we had to identify downhole stratigraphy, then also assign to each one of those lithologic units a thermal conductivity value, and then finally calculate for that entire well, um, for that entire lithology, one weighted harmonic mean thermal conductivity for each well point location. So stratigraphy. So again, as I said, many of these wells had some kind of lithology log, a driller's log completion report that listed depths and lithologies that they, um, they drilled through. Again, the quality of these ranged very widely. So in, in many cases, we had to refer to USGS, our friends at PGO, um, and, and various publications of different ages to decipher certain driller lingo, especially in Southwest Virginia coal fields. OK, so here's just a snapshot of one of our spreadsheets. Um, each one of these columns is a different well. And then we have each one of the different lithologies that was, um, that was hit down hole listed um, down, down along this column. And you can see each different lithology has been color coded. And then here at the bottom in, in yellow of each one of those lithologic units, we have the thermal conductivity value. That thermal conductivity value that is assigned to each unit is based on um, John Costain's work. 
specific to Southwest Virginia. So instead of using generalized thermal conductivity measurements per different rock types, we decided to use values that we thought would be more accurate because they were specific to specific rock types in Southwest Virginia. So hopefully that, increase, that would increase our accuracy a little bit. And so listed in here we have um, the top and bottom interval for each one of these lithologic units and then the total thickness. Okay, so then we get to calculate the weighted harmonic mean thermal conductivity for the entire well. And so we just did that by adding up the total thickness for all the lithologies and then identifying what percent, what relative percent um, each lithologic unit had for that entire section. So we were weighting essentially their, how, how relevant the thermal conductivity measurement for sandstone was in, in that well versus shale, for example. And that gives us a total uh, calculation here of our, our mean thermal conductivity. So those values uh, ranged quite a bit from 2.5 to 3.5-ish. Okay, and I'll get back to that. But let's move on with our heat flow calculation. So then we wanted to look at thermal gradient. We've done our um, thermal conductivity, now we actually want to look at the gradient. So we did this by looking at, again, each one of the individual temperature logs for each one of our wells. And this gave us, this is good because it gave us an opportunity to really look in detail and see how, how decent our data was. It also allowed us the opportunity to look in detail at these different curves and see if there were any major temperature spikes that were perhaps caused by groundwater interference, groundwater flow. Um, and if we saw those, we removed those from our total calculation. And in order to do, the, to do this, we had to look at the temperature log. So here's just one example. Um, here's temperature in degrees C and depth in meters going from 650 to 1850 for this one particular well. This is in Dickinson County, um, Dickinson 231. This is a, this well's temperature curve. And so we were able to look at the entire curve and identify specific set segments that looked pretty smooth, that looked like they had decent gradients. And so for each one of our wells, we looked at each one of the curves and selected sections. Maybe the entire log was good. Maybe there were portions that were good and we averaged the um, values for those portions. But here's just a quick example. And you can see the R squared is 0.9979, so it's a pretty good fit. And that would give us a gradient of 29.6 for this well in particular. So 29.6 degrees C per kilometer. And from the calculations we've done so far for gradient, that's, that's pretty typical. Okay, so remember back to this earlier slide, we said for all of our entire data points, um, we have a rough gradient of about 25C per kilometer. So we can see now, as we look at each individual temperature log, how those gradients compare to what we kind of are assuming from our total data set. And here we know for um, the entire Eastern U.S., we have a range of 10 to 50 degrees C per kilometer. So it kind of falls right in the middle of the accepted range for Eastern U.S. So we think we're doing okay. So we have, at this point, calculated pretty much all of our thermal conductivity weighted harmonic mean means for all of our logs, temperature logs, for Southwest Virginia. We just need to go back and smooth over them and make sure that they're all correctly calculated. But basically, all of the values give us a range between 2.5 and 3.5-ish watts per meter Kelvin. So this is a, a pretty decent range. And then all of our thermal gradients also have been almost calculated. We're about halfway through-ish calculating those. And um, for the ones we've completed so far, we tend to have a range of between 20 and 30 degrees C per kilometer. So all that's left really is to multiply these two together for each well location. And that would give us one heat flow value per well um, within South, Southwest Virginia. And then all we'd have to do is 
um, interpolate to create a, a gridded surface to give us a contour map of heat flow. So maybe when we're done uh, gridding and calculating, we'll have a heat flow map for Southwest Virginia that looks kind of similar to what Southern Methodist University has produced, and we'll see how, how closely they kind of match up. So in general, on average, with the thermal conductivity uh, measurements and, and gradients that we've calculated, we have a heat flow of about 75 for Southwest Virginia, which is a little bit higher currently than um, the 2010 heat flow map from SMU. Uh, but we also know that when SMU went in and took a, another look at West Virginia in 2011, um, some of their temperature values, some of their heat flow values uh, bumped up a little bit. So maybe our values will correlate more with the most recent work from SMU for 2011, which would be kind of exciting. Okay, so now these are all the different derivative maps that we have gone through the process of producing and are almost done producing. And I think it would be awesome if each one of you guys could produce similar types of derivative tools um, for your state's wells and data. And our plan for Virginia is to add, make all these layers, all these maps accessible to the public through our website. Um, if you go to our DGMR website, uh, which looks like this, and you go down to the bottom of the page, there's a maps and resources link here and this map image. And if you click on that, you can go ahead, Jesse. Um, it'll take you to this awesome interactive map called the Flex Viewer, um, where we have been busily adding more and more data from the geothermal project. And so you can see here, here we go, here's our interactive map. What we have highlighted is the geology, and then um, currently this is depth to bedrock. And this interactive map tool is really nice because you can compare different data layers uh, next to each other. So you can see we've, we've added all these different layers for the geothermal project in particular, the depth to bedrock, thermal, any thermal conductivity measures we had, any well data that we had, all the different well types, um, the thermal springs that I mentioned and all the aqueous chemistry for those springs have been added here, the gravity data including gravity station data and gravity maps, and um, the other derivative maps that I discussed such as the heat pump installations, um, the temperature at depth slices, as well as the final heat flow map will be added as kind of a raster layer, um, raster layers to this interactive tool as well. So we will be displaying our final products online through this Flex Viewer, but then also um, submitting them to the NGDS. So I think all in all, this has been <coughs> a really great product, a really good project, which has given us the opportunity to kind of compile all of this archive, old data going back to the 1800s to modern times and make it publicly available. And not only that, but take the next steps to using this data for some good, not just for other people to use, but as we can use it ourselves by producing these derivative um, map tools that could be useful products for, again, people going out there installing geothermal ground source heat pumps for researchers and for our own future projects as state geological surveys. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? No? Yep. So what is the difference between SMU's national map, how they produce it? Um, that's a really good question. So the, the question was, what's the difference between our heat flow map, how we're doing it, um, versus Southern Methodist University? And we, I mean, SMU, they're the experts with, with heat flow and geothermal. And so we really wanted to try to piggyback on their methodology as much as possible. And so that was really kind of our foundation, was um, how, they, how they did their heat flow calculations. Um, however, we have a different data set. Um, we have different software available or not available to us. Um, and we had some different ideas about how we should do this. 
you know, Southern Methodist University um, projected temperatures bait from their heat flow calculations, essentially. And so they were able to make temperature at depth slices of at really deep depth kilometers uh, depth. And I didn't want to do that because I didn't trust myself enough with the calculations um, <laughs> to, to do that. So I, I really wanted to start on the platform of these are the actual temperature logs that we have. These are measurements that were made out in the field, and we can use them as the raw data. And so that's why my slices are, are much shallower, because I wanted to use data that I could trust rather than use a calculation and project, project it up. That's something that could be done in the future and probably should be, just based on, on the platform of what we've produced. Um, and then for the heat flow map, actually, it's kind of similar. Um, we use the Harrison correction, so did Southern Methodist University, they use the Harrison correction as well. They smoothed the Harrison correction, um, tailored it based on regional gradients, um, just as we kind of have as well. So there's, the tailoring happened in both cases, but it was just unique based on location. Right, right. So there were a lot of similarities, um, but the data set is, is different, um, and some of the methodology is different. Uh, Wendy, one thing that you are doing differently, I think, is that I don't think Dave Blackwell did. <laughs> you are you, you you would like to determine heat flow at different depth intervals. Well, and uh, mm -hmm. and and so that's and, and the thing is that you should get the same answer. Yeah, we're not. No matter what the depth interval is, you should get yeah. the same answer. We're only and calculating, so we're only kind of a check. doing yeah. temperature at depth slices. Right. We're only doing one heat flow map right. um, for Southwest. So we're not calculating at different depths. We're just no, but I mean, um, you showed one slide. With the gradient? With the gradient. Yeah. And so you can determine the heat flow over that section. Right. And then as a check, quality check, you can go to a different section, a different depth, where the gradient is different. Sure. And therefore, the thermal conductivity is different, but right. the product is the same. Right. So it's a neat check. Because they balance each other out. Thermal yeah, because conductivity and the uh, the gradients are, are linked and kind of opposite. Yeah. Um, so the gradient changes as the lithology changes. And so no matter what downhole, it should be one heat flow value because they kind of balance each other out. Yeah. Any other questions? So are you, are you trying to... You know, in those holes where you have changes in gradient on the hole, are you trying to match the intervals and have constant gradient with the lithology to see yeah. if it makes sense? Yeah, so we have, we went through and calculated our weighted harmonic thermal conductivity uh, means first for the entire hole, for the entire length of the temperature log. So we have those entire calculations, so the lithology downhole encompassing each one of the entire temperature logs. And now that we've selected the specific sections of the temperature logs that we want to trust for gradient, then we can go back into the lithology and pick the section that correlates and um, just do a, a, a check for that one um, weighted mean for that section of the lithology. Yeah. So in, in your, your sort of average picture there, mm -hmm. the, with everything all together, the implication is the gradient generally is steeper, shallow, and then less steep down deep. Is there a sort of broad vision correlation with this particular thing on the elevation plateau that makes sense for that? I believe that that is simply due to the fact that the correction is different. So we applied the Harrison correction in, in a different way. Um, because we had our control shallower than 1,000 meters, um, we knew what the temperatures should be in general, and also what the gradient should be. So I was able to tailor the Harrison correction so that it, it matched that gradient and matched the control of the mean annual air temperature as well as our um, geothermal test well that was in thermal equilibrium. So shallower than 1,000 meters, I think we were pretty good. But remember, I tapered off the Harrison correction so by the time you hit 1,000 meters, it's 100% Harrison correction applied. Now, so just because of that transition, 
it means that it's steeper, deeper than it is shallower. So below a thousand meters, it's a steeper gradient. I think that's just the difference is just because I tapered off the correction in the shallows. It seems like if that if that correction is is accurate, mm -hmm. and you are seeing that kind of change in gradients, it would imply that sort of broadly you should also see a change in sort of the conductivity. Well, so I, I understand what you're saying, but I think. I think the issue is specifically, I mean, if, if you go back and look at that slide, um, before we tapered off the correction, it's linear. Um, before we applied the correction, it's somewhat linear um, in general. So I think the curve has been accentuated by my tailoring of the Harrison correction. And I think that is a good argument for why we should perhaps also taper off the correction deeper as well. The only reason we didn't do that um, is because, down here, let's see, yeah, so, I mean, this is pretty much linear. It's just below a thousand meters. That's also pretty much linear, but there's that transition point right there when we go to 100% Harrison correction, but I think this also needs to be tapered off, but I didn't want to do that because we have no control at that depth. So we don't know for certain how much we should be trusting or not trusting the Harrison correction. So I thought it was safer to just apply it in general and assume that it would be more correct at depth. Um, one thing we could do, however, is we could project um, this gradient, this temperature for the, our geothermal test well um, at depth and see how it intersects, intersects down here with our temperature values. And if it's a significant difference, then maybe we could just, again, tailor the Harrison correction at depth just based on the offset from our thermal equilibrium control geothermal law. Um, and I think that would probably get rid of that, that change. So yeah. these, these wells are all on the Allegheny Canyon Plateau, right? Yes, that yeah. So is the, is the stratigraphy relatively consistent between them? Yeah. It is, um, again, these wells uh, span the entire Appalachian Plateau. So, you know, when you come down here to, this is Wise County, I believe, am I right? Lee, 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 County. Lee County. Um, you know, the stratigraphy is, is somewhat different <laughs> than you'd see up here. Um, and like I said, we used uh, publications that had cross-sections, um, for coal seams, as well as the lithology logs, is kind of a, a cross check for what we're seeing. Um, and also the terminology used is, some, is sometimes a little bit unclear, um, but using, using cross sections as kind of our, our background check or stack columns, um, we were able to kind of weed out and figure out what, what units we should be going through. But I mean, this is, that is a source for error. Like I said yesterday, it's all based on the quality of the data to begin with and um, how how decent the logger was or the driller uh, was when they were out there in the field. If, if the logger was a true geologist who knew what he was looking at and accurately in-depth recorded what, what formations or um, lithologies they were drilling through, then we can, you know, rely on that as greater accuracy. But that wasn't always the case. Yes. Can you show the slide with all three data sets for Harrison correction and Paul Davis and the, I think it's one more forward. And then, okay, yeah. I'm right there. Uh -huh. I'm just, another possibility is to just shift the raw data to Max Gates data and you don't have to deal with the Harrison correction. Because if you look right. at the raw data, shifting to the left is different. Yeah, but, you know, according to David Blackwell at SMU, you have to apply a correction. These wells are not in thermal equilibrium. They have to be corrected, which means the gradient has to be steepened. Yeah, but when you correct it, you go to zero degree, you average air temperature. So That's only because of the type of correction that I had to use right. based on our data. I mean, you can do several things. I'm just saying, if sure. you keep it simple and just shift the raw data, it looks to me like the trends are very similar to the trend. Yes, but then the... Uh, then the gradient still is the same. The gradient hasn't been corrected for thermal e equilibrium at that point. Right. And that's the whole point of applying correction, is you have to do something to the data to acknowledge that it wasn't in thermal equilibrium when you took the measurements. Yeah, to me, it just seems to correct, and then you shift it 
<laughs> well, again, it's it's making the assumption that those that came before knew what they're doing, that SMU knows what they're doing, and that the data has to be smooth for this. Uh, again, you just you have to make fewer caveats in your analysis if you just do that. Sure. Uh, one, sure. one of the things that's interesting about that, I mean, that, that heuristic correction is just one of, I guess, several types of corrections you can make for harmonic equilibrium. But the fact is, is that all of them appear to be nonlinear from you know polynomial uh, corrections. And so uh, you know, it makes sense that it's going to not be a linear function. But yeah, I think the question about that you're asking is, you know, can you find some geologic explanation for why that shift has occurred with the Harrison correction is a good one. We we have yet to get into that, but that would be the next step. The the other thing is is considering for each one of these different corrections how their accuracy changes with depth. Um, for the Harrison correction below three thousand meters, it pans out. Um, but all of our data is, you know, most for the most part below 2,000 meters. So if we were breaching that point, I would be thinking about that more. Um, but also, you know, the accuracy of the Harrison correction in the shallows. Most of the work that's been done is based on pretty deep data. Um, a lot of the the bottom hole temperatures that SMU was using were pretty deep compared to ours. So, you know, maybe the Harrison correction at shallower depths just isn't as accurate. And I believe that. Because of the our control ICC well here, that's kind of proving that, and so that was the justification for going ahead and saying, well, why don't we just taper off the the weight of the correction when we get to the shallower depths? Yes, John. Yeah, I think uh, I think what Steve was saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were saying get the heat flow from the shallow depths where you think you've got a good control of the heat correction. Then go to the deeper depths um, and using what you know is the heat flow because it isn't going to change. Um, take a look at uh, the thermal conductivities, which you know from section, and then uh, determine from that the gradient. So you can correct the correction, right? Possibly. I mean, yeah. You, that's what was that what you were getting yeah, at? Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, all this stuff is based on the idea that the heat environment is completely vertical. Yeah, right. Yeah. Fluids and rocks yeah. And all the other oh, yeah, sure. sure. But I, you know, I think, uh, yeah, that uh, you could, you could do that. You could use the heat flow. You could correct. You could check the Harrison gradient by or the Harrison result by uh, determining using the heat flow from above a thousand, and then see what um, the thermal conductivity is from your lithologic log, and then. Compute the gradient from the heat flow correction and see if, and if it doesn't agree with the Harrison correction, the Harrison correction is wrong. Yeah, maybe. Not. And uh, again, SMU used the Harrison correction, but also made some modifications to it so that the correction seemed more accurate for their data sets. Yeah, sorry. How does I mean, we've gone through these points that are <coughs> here are, are not the complete temperature logs. They're snippet temperatures that intersect our temperature at depth slices. So well, they, yeah, I'm assuming you're eliminating the gas cooling expansion from the call intersections and things like that. We have gone through and looked at the entire curves, each one of them, and identified spikes any kind of spikes or major changes in, in temperature gradient, and we have removed those so that what we're left with is what looks like a clean overall temperature curve. Yeah, but if you plot the reservoir temperatures out there, you fluid, produce fluid temperatures, that they should get some place on that it would be consistent with a set of independent measurement of goodness of temperature. So you think that would be a good, another good potential control? I, I would like to have something at depth that we could use, like below the thousand meter mark that we could use to control our, 
our data and figure out how accurate the Harrison correction is. So if anyone has any ideas about that or um, how we should handle the Harrison correction in depth, um, please talk with me about it. Yeah, <laughs> we did. We <laughs> polled, yes. Give me your best guess on how good the temperature measurements may return. We see a five degree flop based upon the values of the, the parts of a uh, of degree Celsius versus you know, the, a lot of variability is just due to the fact they don't use a very accurate measure. You know, again, like I said, this this looks pretty good compared to where we started on day one. So there were many, many, many logs. I mean, I, again, the DGO database has thousands upon thousands of wells and well logs and their temperature logs. But there, there's definitely only a small percent of those that are reliable enough to use for something like this. And we still have a lot more to go through. So there's still potentially a lot more data that we could add to this map. Um, but we just haven't had the time, the chance to complete our kind of temperature recovery from the DGO database. But yes, I'm, accuracies and error is definitely an issue at each step of the way, and, and a lot of it does stem from, from step one, just from the quality of the logs, and the temperature logs themselves and the lithology logs. Um, so we kind of had to weigh that and just drop out the ones that we couldn't rely on. Because one of the things you show in that is you show data points, but you've already said that those are not data points individual, those are actually chains of data points. Exactly. Therefore, yeah. there could be a relationship where one is shifted over and all shifted as a group. Yeah, and we've, we've looked at that, essentially. We've seen each one of the different logs up together. I, I can't do that in Excel because I crash Excel. <laughs> um, I mean, I can join these points and Excel is okay with that. Um, but Again, it's kind of a software limitation at some point. So just quick comments. Um, the SMU project is actually, they're, they're doing a heat flow database update to for the NGDS as well. And that wraps up at the end of September. So they should be releasing um, some new data from, from their uh, sub-recipients and partners. And then the other comment is um, that this is a great product, actually. Um, <laughs> One of our science advisory board members has been suggesting for the last probably year that states do this because the SMU map, while good, is somewhat based on limited points in each state. And so, you know, if you can produce something that higher has more data, density, right, sure. with higher density, then yeah, right. good product. And that was the idea to begin with. You know, we have all of these. Right wells and why not produce something with what we have and you know we for all the other states we you guys have so much data and and good temperature data that i think it's worthwhile to see if you can uh, pursue producing maybe some of these maybe you won't use our methodology or agree with what we've done but um, maybe this is a good model for some of the other states to use yes um on a previous comment seems that uh, this is all based on the assumption that the heat flow is one dimensional in the vertical direction. Um, is that really a good assumption since flow could go and it could be moving in three dimensional three dimensions, especially sure. if the units are, are not perpendicular to the right. to your assumed Well, you know flow? the Appalachian Plateau is nice because we've got lots of flat Relatively flat strata. Um, relatively. Relatively. <laughs> There's some tilt, sure. But, um, you know, we, we focused on southwest Virginia, low-hanging fruit. Um, and I, I, I really would like to make a statewide heat flow map, but I, I have been hesitant about that because of structure specifically. And just wondering how structure might impact heat flow um, and, and trying to figure out how to deal with that. It's so, it's so complex in the other provinces that um, we, I feel like we'd be making some assumptions. But then again, you know, we're, we're basing this off of um, 
a national heat flow map from SMU. So anything that we can add in, hopefully, is going to be better than what we have before it. Um, I do think it's kind of a delicate matter of how to deal with the heat flow values that we would calculate for the rest of the state. Um, and it would be the data points that I showed you for the temperature at depth slice that we produce statewide. So it would be the same same data. Um, but I think you have to do for a three-dimensional heat flow model to be able to see what the impact of the sure. three-dimensional horizontal would yeah. be. I would love to have the type of software available to us that would allow us to create these three-dimensional models. Um, it, you know, you can think of it in your own head and imagine what it would be, but it's just some so much easier to have something visual in front of you that shows you the, the three-dimensional perspective of what you're seeing down the hole. Well, there are three-dimensional uh, groundwork flow models. Right. Heat is pretty much analogous to groundwork flow. Sure. sure. On how there are pretty soft layout out there to right. do that. And again, that ties back into you know what we should do with these temperature spikes that we're seeing down hole and whether or not we can say with any certainty that they're due to groundwater flow or they're due to some problem with the equipment or they're due to some real shift in temperature that's not related necessarily to um, just a, a fracture system with groundwater moving through it. Um, it could be heat flowing in different directions. Right, well, right. Not just Right, right. But then I would think that the peak might not be so, so pointy. <laughs> it's such a there's such sharp peaks in there that, you know, that seems to me like that that's just water. But, but they're in specifically constrained locations, and so when you look at the entire trend for that temperature curve, you know that peak. If it if it weren't there, you'd still have that general trend. Um, Yeah. Um, I know the cost for me. Okay, good. It just you your comment about you know some of the other states nearby they might have the similar data and do similar products and I appreciate that. And there's definitely some merit in that. But I would also think that I think we're at a here where we have to start looking at you know the data that we're putting together in this massive data set and who's going to use it and what our product should be. Right. For example, if we're looking at your graph and we're looking at you know heat flow gradients down at a thousand to fifteen hundred meters, um, who's going to use that? If you looked at if you did a distribution of all geothermal, and I'm using that really broadly for our discussion yesterday, geothermal systems, I'd say ninety five percent of all wells or, or boreholes being put in same system, whatever, are probably 200 meters or less. Right. And any ones that are very deep that I've dealt with are like military installations that are typically hire their own high-end firm that's going to be doing site-specific stuff right. so they can engineer the system correctly. Right. So I would contend that I think our best bang for the buck for derivative products are really looking at putting more effort into more detailed uh, depth bedrock three-dimensional model based on new elevation models, higher density of well points to that, and uh, groundwater temperatures at those lower you know, first few hundred meters and concentrating on that more than, than worrying about some of these things and the corrections that have slopped them plus or minus so many degrees that are really in that zone. I mean, you know, I think in the East Coast we have a bimodal zone of where geothermal potential is, a very shallow zone. And then there might be eventually some, you know, engineered systems going deep into these plutons where this data would be of value. But so many people like said, 98% of everything is going to be yeah. in that other zone. And I think those are the products. And this is back again from feedback I got from drillers and companies that are installing these. And that's what they want to know. They want to know the, those fracture densities. You know, so what's the leakage of your drought? Or, or is your Karst, you know, 30% of the United States is owned by karstic rocks. Well, if you're drilling in systems and losing your circulation, you're taking a feeding if you put a billion to put in, you know, 60 geothermal wells for a new hospital or something. And I think that's the biggest bang for the buck of all the information we can put in on the cars. Right. Uh, get it. Because the spinner wheels and create a lot of stuff that's not going to be used. 
because other people always did it this way. There are two worlds here. You know, one is the world of tools that are useful for people going out there installing geothermal systems that would be installed in our eastern states. And yes, I think a certain tool belt with set of tools is appropriate for those people. And I think it should be made, those tools should be produced and made available. But then there's also this, which is kind of, yes, the next step of well, we have all this temperature data, we might as well take a look at temperature depth. We might as well make a heat flow map and hope that it contributes in some way to the research world um, to kind of further along what's out there. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to have perhaps another workshop where we could specifically invite people from industry and people from companies who are installing ground source heat pumps, um, who are, are drilling the geothermal wells, um, maybe some people who have worked on producing the engineered geothermal systems, just so we could get that perspective um, and, and really hear direct from the source what these people need to know in order to reduce their liability and cost for installing the systems. I, I think don't that's know, really important. We're talking about that more in our next section. You know, tell where we go. But you know, I would suggest uh, for my former role as director of science and technology for National Groundwater, that was part of my job. We were always looking for that creative new conference to create, and they're all different departments. I mean, creating one that might be a joint NGWA ASG conference. They're talking about have this technical part, but also just some of this feedback because that's what we did when we invited those drillers at one time. I mean, invite all these different relating to geothermal the, the majority of the customers that that I have encountered for our state survey have asked specifically I need to know depth to bedrock in this vicinity and so one of these derivatives yes is, is making that data available and it was always there it was in other databases here and there, but if we can create some sort of interactive map product or just you know a flat image that shows point locations, what we've got, then that's great. But right, because of the variability in depth to better, it would be nice if we could have some funding or some sort of momentum to go back out there and get uh, higher resolution data for depth to bedrock rather than just creating an interpolated surface with who knows what kind of accuracy that may or may not be actually of use to someone going out and, you know. Well, I think, you know, if you're putting in a lot of time modeling things, or, you know, for, for example, with LIDAR now, if you've got a very good ground depth revelation model, and you can look at wells and look at depth to bedrock at certain parts as a function of slope mm -hmm. based on geology, because different types of rock develop different slopes, shales versus quartz or anything, what is this kind of Right. And I think from there, then if you start, because that's what you do with the landslide mapping, it's the same thing. It's really based on a lot of slope function, orientation, precipitation. You can do very similar things and probably get very, very uh, specific, much more than a very generalized map. That doesn't benefit anybody. You need something that's almost, you know, on the, at least uh, 124,000. Right. Have, have you looked at ways you might be able to extrapolate from those points to see, you know, okay, you've got 100 feet of not bedrock, whatever it is here, mm -hmm. there's some way to extrapolate over what area that you That's areas. definitely next steps. This was as far as we were able to go because we put more of our energy into the temperature at depth and heat flow maps. But, I, you know, <coughs> like I said here, correlating, if we can correlate this to soil type, to topography, to geology, to provinces, just to give us some better idea of some generalizations we could make uh, so that we could perhaps interpolate a surface that was of some kind of accuracy that would be you know realistic and useful as a tool then I think that would be great definitely um, I think your comments about fracture density and wanting to know more about that right on I don't think there's anybody that I know of um, that doesn't think that the crust is incredibly fractured. And that if you drill down to 10 kilometers, uh, you're going to um, find a 
fluid that's at hydrostatic pressure. And this is especially true for uh, the eastern United States. But I'm told um, that even when they drilled the Sephod hole through the San Andreas Fault, the, the pressures were essentially hydrostatic. And so this is incredible <laughs> that we have a, a, a fractured domain and we don't know how the water is getting down there. And so it's obviously by, by something that I think we're looking at the wrong place. And uh, it's not getting down there by falls because no earthquake anywhere on the planet that I know of has ever been placed on a fall in an intraplate setting. So how is the water getting down there? And so I think the key is the fraction network. Um, and you, you talk to a, a local um, well drill or somebody that um, finds wells for a living, and he looks at the geomorphology, and he looks at these incredible images that we can generate nowadays. <laughs> but he looks at the intersections, and groundwater hydrologists have known for a long time that the intersection of fractures is uh, much more occurring in the network than the fracture plane itself. And so the cracks are uh, fracked. We need to know more about what about um, that core, for example, in the back room is incredibly fractured. So we need to know more about fractures and fracture networks and how the water is getting down so that when you drill a hole 10, 12, 13 kilometers, the uh, pressure is hydrostatic. <laughs> In the interest of time, I, I don't want to cut off discussions. A lot of good questions, but we, we probably need to take a break, which we were scheduled to take about 10 minutes ago. So what we're going to do next is come back and look at the core. But I, I wanted to also offer anyone that wanted to take a look at our office facilities. We would, uh, conduct a, a tour of the shortly after we introduce the core. So uh, let's, how about this, let's just take five minutes, would that be okay? Come back in five minutes and we'll convene at the core. Well, I want to thank uh, Billy and Wendy and everyone else from the Virginia survey for having us. I think it's been a really wonderful workshop opportunity to meet people that have been working on this project, either directly or indirectly. So really do appreciate the opportunity to be here. And this is the interesting part. You know, this is moving into the next phase. And, and for me, this is a new presentation because many of you have been working indirectly through Wendy and the, the survey here. So it'll be interesting to see what your thoughts are. And honestly, um, while I'm going to present, I'd like to leave quite a bit of room at the end for comments, questions, discussion, because we need your feedback in, in ensuring that the system is moving forward. So, I want to thank Ken Taylor for this. Here's my sustainability plan, yes. and now we can talk. <laughs> so, no, if everybody takes this lemonade stand back to their survey and sells two dollars worth of lemonade a day, we should be able to at least keep one of the servers up and running. So. <laughs> All right, so here's just a, a quick uh, outline of what I'll be talking about here. Just a reminder of the NGDS vision, um, some of the assets that we have as state geological surveys, um, the different challenges of sustainability, and particularly sustainability of a distributed network, and then what other incentives do we have to maintain this system. So as a reminder, uh, we presented this system, and we still believe in this system, and that it's sustainable because it's a knowledge sharing network based on open source standards, existing uh, software whenever possible, and that it's online for data discovery and access. There's a low barrier to entry, which then increases your participation. Uh, we are trying to promote awareness to the end user community now, and I'll have a little bit more information on that. And there's a large number of potential collaborators and end users that we can actually reach out to beyond the geothermal community. If you think about the data that we're collecting, you know, what is that data? 
how much of the well data that you have is actually geothermal wells? You know, how much is oil and gas wells versus water wells? So think about the different communities that those touch. All right, and we actually, we were talking about this on a tour just a moment ago, and many of the surveys right now um, have paper publications or have paper publications as their primary means of disseminating information. And so where are we moving to? We're no longer in this paper format. In fact, we just heard from survey here that they've pretty much shut down their paper bookstore, and it's all now online with digital scanned copies. And so it's all moving towards the web. Um, how do we actually monetize this? Do we need to monetize this? How are we successful in doing so? There's a few different options. So the argument here is that we're really in a, a paradigm shift. And how do we how do we move on from where we've been? Um, again, we as state geological surveys, we are data providers. We've got a lot of our information already up on the web. Um, Many of us already have interactive online maps. We saw, again, Virginia survey. Kentucky survey has an online map. I know Delaware has online interactive maps. So we've got all of this already up there. Um, we also have services that we're providing. We saw some images of what we're calling the NGDS data getter. And I believe the name has changed, but I don't recall what it's actually called now. So. Um, but we also have that ArcMap plugin that we developed for this project. You know, we've got products and services that we've developed as state geological surveys. So the challenge here is really to collect and integrate all of that online data, determine the best metrics, who's using that data, how are they using that data, and how do we then put into our agency performance assessment as well as monetary. So what is the content that needs to be maintained in this system? Obviously, the data services and applications that we've developed. Um, in the future, we've already talked about this again, too. We're going to need to make corrections to the data and metadata as people are combing through it and, and seeing what data is out there and, and reviewing the information that's there. Ken, I think, mentioned this um, about some of the North Carolina data. Um, we have to keep that up to date, and we'll have to make sure that metadata is, is maintained and up to date. We also have to we keep up with uh, new software as it comes available, new applications as they come available. Somebody's going to have to maintain this part of the system. So what are the incentives to maintain the part of the system? Well, one of the things that we've been doing with this project is promoting data digitization and data stewardship by the actual state geological survey that owns the data. And again, that's a bit different in this room because a number of you have been working with the Virginia survey, but as you've heard, they're planning to give you back all of the data that they've digitized and collected. So now you have this asset. So what are you going to do with it? Um, another one of the incentives, linking and leveraging those data resources that we have. As I mentioned, we've got a number of different well types. We've got a number of different subsurface information. I mean, that's, that's applicable to more than just geothermal. How do we leverage that? And then achieving this tipping point of users. And, and as we develop more users, more uh, applications, maintaining the individuals on there. Who knew that the web would have however many millions of billions of users a day? So then we also have the data maintenance side. And we talked a little bit about that. You know, how many man hours does it take to get this project up and running and digitized? We've been working on this for over three years now, essentially. Um, and we've got another eight months or so, nine months remaining in it. And as we've heard, there's still data out there that could be digitized, collected, contributed to the system. What are the best mechanisms for doing so? Again, we've talked about individual scripts for databases. We heard Doug um, and the Kentucky survey, they have their own set of databases, right? And then they have a script that essentially converts their database into the, the interoperable content model that we've been using. Um, but that requires individual knowledge within the individual survey. That's not something that, that we can do unless you contact us and say, hey, we need scripture code. But that also will have to be maintained. Um, and then we've got a variety of online processes to help automate the, the system, but those are going to have to require maintenance as well. In terms of actually serving the data, there's a few different options that you can do. And, and again, we've talked about some of these during this <coughs> as well. You've got your physical server set up. Uh, you've got a cloud server, 
and then you've got hosting services. And I would consider kind of what you've got maybe a hosting service, but some of the IT folks and tech folks in this room might disagree. But. So then we've got the entire operations. You know, right now the system design, administration, and maintenance has really been um, at the Boise State University design architecture testing team, and then for our project, the AASC, AASG State Contributions has been at the Arizona survey. Who's going to maintain that once this is completed? Who owns it? Um, there's the education outreach and training to existing participants like this workshop and to new participants as we'll see in just a moment and I wanted to bring up David's uh, discussion of perhaps doing an AASG uh, National Groundwater Association meeting. So how do we bring in new participants? And then there's also maintaining and adding the current providers and then additional linkages and partnerships. So it's all part of that larger education outreach training. So we talked a little bit about cost yesterday too. These are our costs um, that we have figured for maintaining a basic data node at Arizona. Um, this is our proposed salary costs. These include all of the fringe benefits, vacation, holiday, sick leave, time. Um, essentially about one hour a week for a supervisor to ensure that the project is on your way maintaining some of that. Some days, some weeks you might have zero hours, others you might have four, you know, it's about one a week. Um, technician, we figure eight hours a month, so about one to four hours a week, depending on what they're doing, what's needed, and then a big push at one point in the year because all of us know stuff happens. So, and then also in terms of a little bit of new content, making sure that everything is up to date, um, about four weeks a year there for a content manager. What's the cost in terms of the hardware and space requirements? And again, this is based on our survey, so it may or may not be applicable to yours. Um, but this is our best estimate in terms of electricity, our internet costs, um, the software licenses that we have. And again, as we've discussed, we're special. We get the academic as we license. You know, that's fractions of what a regular license costs. And then you actually also have the, the server uh, costs. So about $3,100 there, which brings us up to just over $18,000 per year to maintain our node. And that assumes that you have the server, it's up and running, and you're just maintaining it. Um, and John, this is, goes into a little bit of your question, is what's the fraction between personnel and, and computer? And is, we mentioned yesterday it's about 80 20. How about um, overhead? Well, this does not include overhead. This does not include overhead. And that's going to really vary depending on your institution. Our institutional overhead on federal and direct is 44%. So, um, okay, so as I mentioned down here at the bottom, your pointer, we've had other estimates from about $17,000 a year to about $50,000 a year to maintain one of these nodes. Um, one of the other options that we've been talking about is this CCAN node that we've been developing out of the Boise State University NGDS Design and Testing Project. And I talked to our lead developer on that yesterday by email, and these are some of the needs that he mentioned that you would need. Some form of a machine or virtual machine to which you have full admin rights. Um, a fairly basic system with two gigs of RAM, decent processor, and then the ability to have a virtual machine. And we generally use the Amazon Web Services, which are about $7,500 a month. So that's about $1,200 a year on the high end. And then I brought in the rate of our technician. You know, so you're probably looking at eight to $10,000 a year to run this with personnel costs. All right, so some of the other questions here. Again, who owns the NGDS? Right now it's DOE funded. But does DOE want to keep it? All indications that I've had to say no at this point. They want to see it self-sustaining and maintained. Um, what occurs after the R funding concludes? So for many of you, um, the end of this calendar year is the end of the uh, data project. Um, we have funding through April of 2013, but as you know, after the data comes in, there's processing that needs to be done and deployment that needs to be done. So that's why we've got just a little bit of extra time. What's the best organizational structure for maintaining the NGDS? Is it 
through some form of standalone organization, whether it's a for-profit entity, a nonprofit entity, is it national or international? Do we go for uh, being in some sort of incubator organization? Do we go to AASG and say, will you maintain the NGDS, or do we go to some other uh, organization like a Data One or uh, Earth Science Information Partners and say, do you want to help us maintain this system until we're up and running? And then location, I have here as all in real estate say, right, location, location, location matters. Doesn't matter where we're based, where the NGDS is hosted. Do we need to be in a geothermal hotspot like we know Nevada? Do we need to be in a political hotspot like Washington, D.C.? You know, where does this, does it matter where we are based as an entity or an organization? And then, again, it goes into the who owns it, but who manages the NGDS? So some of the things in terms of, of business models and plans here is, is who's using the data? And we've talked a little bit about metrics, and there's, there's some hindrances when we're talking metrics. You know, we're, we're talking about geothermal exploration and development, and a lot of that is going to be done by private sector entities. Do, do they want to know, or do they want us to know, where they're looking for data? Might be considered proprietary information, right? If somebody's doing exploration in a certain part of um, the Great Basin, do they want company X to even get a hint of where they're looking for that? So there's, there's some issues on, on data um, collection. What's the value to industry, to DOE, and to others? Um, one of the reasons that this NGDS project was funded was that in 2008, Deloitte, a private company, put out a, a um, paper to DOE saying these are the hindrances to geothermal development. And one of them was uh, financing. There's too high of a risk right now. Um, there's not enough uh, definitive knowledge about what's happening in terms of exploration. And so reducing that exploration risk to promote financing, to promote uh, quality geothermal resources is one of the major risks. So what's the value to industry? You know, we haven't had that economic analysis yet. Uh, how can we leverage resources from other projects? We've talked a little bit about the DOE Building Efficiencies Program, and in particular this room, uh, the application of ground source heat pumps. And what about the data preservation project? I mean, in reality, isn't this one big data preservation project? And then how do we diversify that client base? So I mentioned the Deloitte report, but here's one from the International Energy Agency that uh, was published in 2011 talking about key actions in the next 10 years. And one of those key actions is to develop publicly available databases, protocols, and tools for geothermal resource assessment. And that's exactly what we're doing here in the US with this project. So a couple of the options that we've already discussed, but to get your brain thinking about it again before we move into the discussion portion is how do we build that into operating costs? Does that become part of your indirect to have these data services there? I mean, does our indirect go from being 44% a year to 48% because, or whatever the equivalent is, because we now are doing data services on top of it. Do we try and get donations uh, for this type of, of work? We get sponsorships from geothermal industry to maintain and help keep this up. How about advertising? Do we have a banner along the NGDS side that's rotating with different companies on it? What about subscriptions to cover the cost? One of the things that we cannot do is we can't charge access to the data for pure profit purposes because this is federally funded, right? So you can't go out and charge people thousand dollars for a license unless it's paying for the maintenance of the system. So we've got to figure out the true maintenance costs and then say, okay, how many users do we expect? And then wrap that into some form of subscription cost. So that's it's difficult. Anything else? You know, this is where the ideas comes in. And then, of course, there's also this new open data federal mandate. And I believe uh, that's next. So, um, in February of 2013, here, the White House's Office of Science and Technology put out this memorandum. And for those that can't see in the back, the subject is increasing access to the results of federally funded scientific research. And the key components here are that it has to be uh, digitally formatted scientific data resulting from unclassified research supported fully or in part by federal funding should be stored and publicly accessible to search, retrieve, and analyze. We're doing that. Promote the deposit of data in publicly accessible databases. Again, NGDS is currently doing this. 
and provide for the assessment of long-term needs for the preservation of scientific data, digital formats taking into account efforts of private and public sector entities. And this is one where probably a little, uh, uh, think of the word I'm looking for. We're not quite as on target with this one because we're talking about long-term preservation here in this talk, so that's up and coming. But in response to this, on May 9th, there was an executive order making open and machine-readable the new default for government information. And key points here are that government information should be managed as an asset throughout its life cycle to promote interoperability and openness, again, key components of this project, and to ensure that data are released to the public in ways that make the data easy to find, accessible, and usable. And we talked a little bit about data.gov yesterday. That's essentially what data.gov is doing for as well. And in follow-up to the executive order, now how do you implement that? We've got the Office of Management and Budgets Implementation memo from May 9th that again talks about, and it's very, very broad, accessible, discoverable, usable, machine readable and open formats, data standards, common core and extensible metadata, all things that we've been working on on this project since day one. We've been putting all of this effort into the back end so that all of the data is then machine readable and easy consumable formats. Interoperability is key, that it's scalable, flexible, and facilitate the extraction of data in multiple formats and for a range of uses. Again, all things that we've been doing within the NGDS. How can we now take the NGDS and help meet these mandates that are coming out of federal government? So, what are we currently doing? We are working on packaging the NGDS, and I noticed online we've got one of our uh, new packagers on. Uh, we're helping to simplify participation, for example, through the CCAM development, through um, we've got the Excel to NGDS schema tool, and we're trying to make it a little bit easier for people to participate. We're also working with uh, technology product launch specialists right now, and we just started working with them. They just started doing the interviews on our staff. Um, this week, actually, and we're, we're really trying to package NGDS and the process that we've been using for achieving that open data uh, success so that we can then inform other users, potential users, of that. Uh, we're doing outreach to data providers through workshops like this. Um, we've got a new YouTube account that we're doing. We're putting up um, webinars. Uh, any of our tech transfer, our tutorials are going up onto this YouTube site, trying to make it a little bit easier and accessible. We're also working on cookbooks and tutorials and training materials for people so that they can do that. And then the tools for delivery, like I mentioned, the Excel to NGDS. We are planning to do some outreach to end users, and we've, we've been targeting the high temp electricity producing companies on this. Um, we have quite a few papers at the Geothermal Resources Council coming up in October, end of September, early October. Uh, we, I know, are involved on four through the primary design testing and then a number of the subrecipients in the warmer states like Idaho, Utah, um, have all submitted at least one, if not two or three papers to this meeting. And this really is the big meeting for end user engagement and outreach. And we're pretty excited because they have just approved in the last few weeks for us to have our own individual workshop um, to attract end users. And I've already received a request from the U.S. Energy Association Agency, U.S. Energy Agency, about coming in and participating in this workshop. So I'm pretty excited about that. And we're, we're doing invitation, but we're also opening it up for people that want to come in. Uh, at this meeting, we'll also have our general demonstration booth but we're doing a double booth this year. So on one side, I'm proposing to have a demonstration, and on the other side, a testing node. So we'll have tables and laptops where people could come in and start driving the system. And so really getting that end user engagement and letting them see what's available and out there. Um, additional conferences and workshops, and I put this slide in just really quick based on um, what David was saying earlier, but we've, we've got a potential here potential group of end users, and a lot of organizations use conferences to fund their, their work throughout the year. I mean, if you think about AGU, right, that's 20,000 people there that come to San Francisco every year, and while there's a huge cost to put it on, that's also their primary funding mechanism throughout the rest of the year. So can we maybe use conferences and workshops as we're making these training tools available to help sustain the system as we move on? Uh, we're also looking at a potential VC-based workshop on open data and collecting uh, 
sponsors right now. We already have confirmation from the USGS that they're willing to help co-sponsor that. Uh, we've talked to DOE about it. We've also talked to NSF. And I'm sure I'm talking for AASG here, but I'm sure we could talk to AASG and, and have some involvement from them. Are there other ways? Other conferences? And then the other thing that we're looking at is in, we're investigating a nonprofit organization for the NGDS, US Geoscience Information Network. And this is where that discussion of maybe an incubator agency comes in, or do we even need to form our own nonprofit? Can we maybe slide in with somebody else and have this be a project uh, component of their, their, uh, their work plan? But these are three of the organizations that we're working, looking at and doing case studies on. So Mozilla, I noticed you guys were using Firefox. Almost everybody knows Mozilla, but they have an independent software foundation that maintains their, their operations. Uh, the Open Knowledge Foundation is, is out of the UK. They're the ones that back or, or have developed CCAN, and they have uh, their organization that promotes. And then also Apache um, is one that we're looking at, and they're responsible for open office if you want to use that. So where does that leave us? Um, I like this word, I'll just kind of read this, from the, the OMB, um, or the executive order. There's a word of the executive order. But uh, are there additional data sets out there that we need to maintain and collect? And who do we go to to help fund that? Um, I, I mentioned it before, but the Building Technologies Program is a very obvious location to try and get some more money and some more funding out of, particularly on these East Coast, Northeast states. Um, do we go to the, the Water Well Association, the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association, water well drillers to try and get a little bit more information. I mean, if this is the type of information that they need, maybe they can help fund it. Uh, economic data, we've talked a little bit about getting some more um, actual costs of this, but as well as what are the benefits. And this is just that discussion of the National Lab RFP that we had. There were two heat pump related um, solicitations, and these were for lab only, which I was really bummed about. but. Um, one was the data analysis from our funded ground source heat pump demonstrations, and the other was to generate a uh, countrywide map of geothermal or ground thermal conductivity for ground source heat pump assessment. And this is one where I think that we could really go to the building technologies program, and particularly the technology manager who was actually invited to this. I'm hoping he's on. Um, but uh, maybe we can get a one-on-one -on -one meeting with him at AASG liaison, or we can get a group of us up to DC and talk to them. Um, some of the other things that we're working on at the AASG Associates meeting this last year, there was a discussion of using USGEN to integrate um, all survey publications. So we've done a number of geothermal relevant publications for this project. Can we maybe work as AASG as a whole to bring in all of our publications into a, a catalog so that it's searchable through the AASG site? Um, most state geological surveys already have an existing publications list, so it should be a fairly simple process of transfer of that. Um, and then, oh, this is one that we've been talking about here is how do you how do you actually so one of the things that we've been selling is that this could be your data sharing platform for all of your state geological survey data. Well how do you actually do that? And we're working on implementing that at the Arizona survey. So is there a way that we can um, provide the tools and materials to the other states in order to actually make it available? So with that, I was going to take some notes if that's all right on the computer or we can I wanted to talk to you about these ideas, concepts, where does it, what do you think? Okay. Well, I'll start with the RFP from mm -hmm. the agency. Um, you notice in the discussions on the second bullet it says the geological survey. That did not say the state. It did survey. not it say. USGS is what it said. Right. Federal agency is supposed to know more about this than any, anybody else in the country, mm -hmm. which is totally wrong. But you know, we want to get in there and, and understand that some of the stuff is, you mentioned a lot of issues, a lot of things there. One of the critical elements I think about the sustainability of this is that as, uh, as Dave mentioned about, you know, the, the gen system is basically becoming, the gen and it are becoming the same thing. Mm -hmm. Where, I'm not speaking for you Dave, but it's like I'm just saying, the issue about it being, it's, you see this as being absorbed into US gen. Well, it's, it's so, 
to clarify, and USGIN is the, the standards protocols and, and NGDS is an implementation of USGIN. So it is essentially one and the same, it's just NGDS is more geothermal well. So, yes. But other than that, what are some other ones throughout this that assume that USGIN? At this point, we, this is it, right? And the one geology yeah. US. One geology. Yeah. Sort of yeah. There's two applications, one geology and, and two mm-hmm. At this point. Soon to be publications if we have them with. Oh. But you're right in that it did say geological survey as USGS. And actually what was interesting is um, NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab out of Colorado, contacted us based on the work that we were doing here on the NGDS about um, writing a letter of support for this. And we said, okay guys, you know, we, we can't do anything for free, essentially is what we said, but you can have access to the data catalog and we'll help you walk through the data catalog and see what's there. Um, we also got a request from Oak Ridge National Lab and we said essentially the same thing there. But saying if you want the state surveys to participate, and I'll be blunt here, I mean, we weren't this blunt, but it's, it's going to, I mean, this was a $22 million project over almost four years. And if you want the same level of participation from state geological surveys, it might cost, I mean, maybe not that same amount of money, but it's going to cost a little bit to get surveys to participate. Mm-hmm. I see, what I look at from the, and we're having discussions of the mm-hmm. compensation, are you looking at the concept of that once it is collected, there will be very little new data put into it. That would not be our intention, though. No. We would like to continue adding data. And that's where things like the nonprofit organization that can potentially go out and get uh, foundation-related money, like the Sloan Foundation. Um, they fund quite a lot of data integration, data development. Um, but it's, it's difficult as a state entity honestly, to go out and get some of this money. So that's where having a 501c3 scientific nonprofit or uh, system-based uh, nonprofit comes in. So, yeah. I attended a couple of these uh, Earth Cube workshops. Yes. I know Lee's aware of those personally. You can lead on that as well. But uh, it was interesting. Uh, the one that I went to that was for the um, critical zone observatory folks that have done a lot of academic research at some of the hydrologic institutes and they look at the critical zone as being the zone of the earth that's basically from the lowest circulation of groundwater, which can be argued where that is, up to the tops of the biozone and the tree tops, which really encompasses the zone where the state geological survey collected data on water and minerals and nitrogen soils. But it seems like they are struggling with, you know, there's, there's all this dark data they call it, you know, that stuff collected from studies funded by NSF that goes into drawers and then professor gets a grant to the next one and it never gets out there or published in some form. But, you know, they were going through a lot of the same wrangling that we did in the early part of this, but how do we do that? How do we get this data? And it seems like we are to be poised in a great spot to be not only the nodes for surveys, but the nodes perhaps for academic institutions that in their state. Told the NSF people, this is only going to happen. You mandate it on the grant. Mm-hmm. The professor has to submit that data before you move on to the next one, otherwise it will just continue to stay there. Right. And they'll dump out of graduate students and they never do it either. But if you were to do that, you know, and put it into the right form, the surveys could be those store holders and they just log in and watch what we're doing. But they just can't be the ones that place and chase it down. Absolutely. But anyway, seeing that they're talking about this data as being a big administratively driven long-term project. There might be a way to capitalize on that and also offer a service that we're already trying to tell way ahead of a lot of other groups are doing. I think the same things they're envisioning is kind of like I want to jump up nice. We're and you should. That. You should. And, and the, I more, the more because, um, and, and I, I should have mentioned EarthCube in this project. I probably should have done more justice to EarthCube than I did here. But, uh, we have we have been involved in the EarthCube project as well. 
Um, but I think the more people, the more state geological surveys that can get involved in our queue, that can get involved in this and saying, look guys, you know, not only have we been working on data preservation, data management, and open source, interoperable, accessible data for the last three and a half, four years on this NGDS project. We've been doing it for how long has the, the data preservation program for the USGS been around? Well, maybe five okay. uh, years, but I want to state you out but story. That's our mission. That's right. Yeah. That's what we do. We collect. Exactly. Every one of us have that somehow written in our organic bags and collect and hold and disseminate this time for data. So that's that's our business model. That's what you do. And, and your point is well taken because out of that meeting, I will tell you that, you know, you can tell I'm not one that keeps quiet. <laughs> and um, they did really acknowledge and, and appreciate the state geological survey presence there because they had not known. They had the same issue how we have all these core of this data, we don't know what to do with it, it's rotting away and all. And I told them, you know, where we do the data preservation, but nobody in that room have heard about it because they're more from the academic side. And they value knowing about it as a part of your state survey. And they find the value, they may find the support to actually keep that collection as well. So, I, yeah, I think NSF is really an untapped source for state geological surveys. And, and I think this is something um, that, you know, Lee and I have talked about it, and I think it's come up at a few AASG meetings as well. But I, I, I think that, go back to your state geologists and looking at the two state geologists in the room here too, for, for the next liaison, you know, really try and let's get on the NSF um, agenda and their view because you're right, you're absolutely right. They are they are focused on academia. Um, and and I can tell you I've been going to their liaison for like twelve years and we've been on their agenda every year. Every year? Twice to us. And you probably can't crack the nut because the people that are the program officers tend to look down their nose. At state size people and, and so we've got to convince them that you really need us. So we have these tools and that's what we do. You know, if you, even if you don't want to fund us for quotation basic research, this other thing that we bring to the table is for everybody. It's very valuable. You guys need to recognize value. Right. So and that's where that nut needs to be cracked and us talking to certain local people is just not how it's not the opportunity of the chair over the issue about the, the executive order. So that applies to NSF. Mm -hmm. The NSF goes back to the academics that have been getting money for years and years and years, and yet the only map they ever published is the two inch by four inch picture in the uh, geophysic, uh, you know, the geology or other magazine, other right, publication right. where their their geological map, where it's not done at the scale anybody else can use, and it's not available from any, anybody because it's in a published article. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing, the published article, the NSF, right. funded by NSF, but it's like, now, where's the map that you use? Mm -hmm. The map at a scale that other people can use. Now, one of the things I'm most concerned about Look at the situation, see where, you know, I had a person from one of the private institutions in North Carolina, private higher education institution in North Carolina, had put in on a, uh, we have public records law in our state. Mm -hmm. He arrived to see all the data we had, including my thoughts and concepts on the shale gas project, and that was two and a half meters of books of stuff there. So he can go data diving for his master's, his professor at center. So it's like, okay, the data was collected by Dr. Reed and myself, mm -hmm. based on Dr. Reed, and now Dr. Reed's work is not to be published by a student where they simply right. put it into an open domain. When did you run the samples? Did you collect the samples? Did you walk the outcrops? But you took the pictures from what we had taken to have that for that. And I had a student explain to him, he was like really, really incensed the fact that, no, it's public record. I said, no, I'm calling up the policy for your university on academic requirements about intellectual property preservation of other sciences. Mm -hmm. This is our intellectual property we are giving to the world, and we are publishing through existing structures we have with USGS and others. Give me the data to use so you can actually um, Pre-publish what we're publishing. It's worth it. So, so one of the, you're, you're so actually. Yeah, I, have to think, I look at there and see we've never had an analysis made of what is the value of this system. What is the actual value of the information? If we brought in a group of 50 people from the industry and said, "What is this worth to you?" 
Well, if the data has got problems with it, where 90% of the data is semi-accurate or got you know QA QC issues to deal with it, you know it's just whatever we took whatever slot they had and threw it through the system. They turned it into digital form, and that's it. it's the system there versus it's a tight QA QC. You know, actually behind it saying this is good. You can put money on it. Well, and, and so you bring up a couple of points here, and, and I'm trying to address them in the order. The, the first one is that the issue of data reuse and intellectual property is something that, that the EarthCube project is really struggling with as well, because right there what you're saying is, you know, we're the ones that collected the data, we're the ones that know the background of it, we're the ones, you know, and, and I'm trying to think how to phrase this. But that, that's a big concern to people in the EarthCube community, is somebody going out there and scooping the data that you have collected and either publishing with it and not giving them credit for the collection or not giving you any credit at all, or misreading that data. And so that's a huge concern, and, and I don't have an answer for that, but that, that's something that the EarthCube community is struggling with. The, the second part that you were talking about, and I lost it. Actual value. Well, oh, actual value. Yes. Um, yes, we can go ahead and, and maybe that's something that we can work into our GRC, upcoming GRC workshop and just say, hey guys, after playing with this, you know, what is the value to you? What would, if, if you could put a value, and that's very subjective, I realize that, um, what's the value to you as, as an end user, potential end user? That could be a first step. And then the last part was you were talking about um, not only monetary value, but quality. quality, data quality. That's where maintaining ownership within your survey is so important as well, because you're not just submitting it somewhere else. You're the one that has that data. You're the one that, you know, supposedly, and, and again, this is a, a room that is slightly different, but you're the one that's compiled this data. And so, because it's in your hands and in your office and you're deploying it, we would hope that you're wanting to deploy and serve up the most relevant and best quality data that you can. And so that's where keeping that data ownership within the data, primary data provider is so important because you do have that extra level of be it pride or, or wanting to ensure that your data is in its most accurate form um, when it's delivered to the public. But it's not just that, I'll have to say, because there is such a range of data out there that we've compiled that was collected by scientists over the course of hundreds of years. Absolutely. And, and we can't changed. judge the quality of it necessarily right. when we submit it. But I think that's almost good because then it's like the responsibility of the end user mm -hmm. to recognize this is the data set. This is what exists. And I can see based on the quality of the data that there's room for improvement, meaning we should go out and build more wells. We should revisit these areas because obviously the quality of laws that exist isn't so good. Right. Where do I need to concentrate my research? Exactly. So right. it, it brings up the importance <clears throat> of the opportunity for more it, important. It's a double-edged sword, though, because um, I know I worked on this on the goal from this National Groundwater Monitoring Network mm -hmm. effort. I'm one of the proponents of that. And we've gone through the hill trying to get money through Congress. Mm -hmm. um, the Secure Water Act actually authorized the creation of this without having the program. But you know, if you start showing where states have wells and things, you're presenting all this data and getting it out there, then somebody turns out and looks at it and goes, we've got plenty of data. We don't need to clean up the rain anymore. They don't understand that they're in part using that to lighten up the holes are where you need more stuff. But it, it's, you've got to be very careful when you're looking at the funding because how they interpret what they're looking for. And, um, and you know, by us putting all our data and making it all available, I applaud you for something you said earlier about when you're talking to people like, you know, wait a minute, it's going to cost state surveys or somebody to keep that up. Mm -hmm. Don't ever forget that because, I mean, for example, I saw an abstract just recently at a national meeting where some people, or a federal employee, go out there, they're doing this study because all this free data, that was the exact words they used, mm -hmm. and it was all from state surveys of other state agencies in different states. So paying free, somebody paid, you know, taxpayers blah blah, paid to collect the manage them blah, you know, and if you make it appear that way, um, then it, there's no more funding for the people. That's the connection, they think that it's all there, you don't need to do it. 
See, one of the things I have an issue with is, for example, International Energy Agency's report. Mm -hmm. It has a member, the title of it was uh, Energy and Power. Isn't that what it was? I'm sorry. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes, geothermal heat, heat and power. And power where mm -hmm. it's a, it looks like it's a generation station. Right. As opposed to it being, so if we spend $100 million on 13 of these big, giant, mega, you know, geothermal mm -hmm. power stations to generate electricity, and how many home heating exchange systems do we have to have built in order to equal that the uh, amount of money spent on both is even? And, and I million, think this is this is where homes have to be equipped with a heat right. system. And as you were talking about Dave yesterday, was some of these systems are incredibly simple to do because they really are just the heat exchange. It's not geothermal using the earth's heat to heat your water or something like that. It's just you know a way to dispensate heat or collect cold. Well, and that's where that's where I I think, and again, particularly for this group getting out to either industry or the building efficiencies program to, to get some additional funding to collect data that's related to heat pump systems is so crucial and so important. Um, you know, I, I the, the funding agency that's funding this project, the Geothermal Technologies Office, is related primarily to the promotion of this heat and power you know, heat and power. And um, I know that, again, in this room, it's it's not nearly as relevant as it is out west, but that's the, the primary impetus of this project is to promote exploration for heat and power. Um, and, and so that's where maybe the next phase, and that's why a lot of the data that we've been collecting has been more related to this rather than heat pump systems. But we can very easily transition into that heat pump system. And I know some of the states that are cooler have been working on heat pump data, and that's great. So let's expand it. Let's say we did this for this group here. You know, we can expand upon it now. Um, we've got a base set. Let's move on to the next next group. Jody, you want to say anything about heat and power? Uh, heat and power, we got it. But I mean, on heat pumps, um, on another program. Uh, The geothermal heat pumps, um, people are actually uploading their data set to the geothermal data repository, right. which is available on the OpenAI um, GDR. And will be within the NGDS catalog. Yep. And so, all right, so there, it actually come to us um, in Fox and are going to our meeting and said, uh, we want to put our data there. So they've got their data there as well. So we, they've, and they've got, they've got it. Starting to bring in some nice tier two data sets, uh, and eventually they'll be tier three. We don't, we don't have. So the, yeah, this is where that that leveraging other applications of the data system, and, and really going out and finding more end users, new end users of the system uh, comes into play. And and I, at the beginning, yeah. the idea was geothermal power, but it's just like anything, really. Right, and it's scalable. Right. It's scalable. And I wanted to actually bring up, because we were talking at breakfast this morning, and I'm curious about the answer, maybe for the discussion. Did you want to ask a question? Thank you. Gosh. Very quickly, Doc. Okay. I've struggled in a room. Uh, are there any states uh, where a water well driller has a generator or the geothermal well driller or the irrigation well driller or the oil and gas driller, it doesn't matter, uh, goes online and basically fills out their construction report online where that data goes right into the database. Are there any, is there any states represented here right now where that occurs? We're about to implement a system where they, the well and gas driller can enter completion data. Um, 
but it's still going to be um, voluntary, I guess. But at least, at least we'll have the system there. We can't, we can't mandate that they do it. It's not the, the regulatory agency for that. But we're you, you don't have a system to do it if they want to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then once the law changes, we can't mandate that they do it. But hopefully. Yeah. Well, the red system is also like the trial is electronic, but you have to have a majority for all. You know, when I left New Hampshire, we had a grant to develop the Supreme Court that way. It's so well versed in freedom of petition. So. The, the entire permit process through the Division of Gas and Oil in the state of Virginia is all electronic permitting. And there are some components of it that I mean, is a direct tie in to the databases and data sets, such as if uh, one of the operators was fishing for a disbursement on an escrow fund, there is an interactive data sheet that they end up coming out about three or four pages long, but they actually enter all the data components themselves, and this is something we've just completed in the last couple of months, that it creates a legal document out of that and, and, and captures that information to be able to end up doing the final product as far as some of the board orders and capturing the information within the database that's maintained and continued. Um, but the responsibility is for them to be able to enter all the information themselves because if they were originally coming in, it was hard copy, and then we were having to do an administrative process as far as the clerical process just to go ahead and reformat and add that in. So it put all the onus back upon the operators. But, but we have created data systems and integrated databases that's functionally doing that same thing with a different application. But, but it is working very well. But, but you're not capturing the well construction in that system. Um, I mean, it could easily be expanded in, into that. Yeah. Um, okay. Where, as of today, it's not. That's that's not the data sets that's being captured, yeah. but the technology and the template to be able to do that and potentially be expandable has been demonstrated. North Carolina current rules are you have to be a licensed well driller in North Carolina, licensed by North Carolina to be drilling a hole, whether it be for geothermal, whether it be for whatever it is, including oil and gas. So that means that every oil and gas company that comes into North Carolina has to hire a well driller certified North Carolina to be the driller in charge at the drill bit. Moreover, is as if the well construction application, or the well construction application, where you, this is what the design I'm going to use for drilling my well, casing and all like that included. That is captured. That's the Division of Water Quality. It's now been absorbed into the Division of Water Resources. That will be amended. We're also under the mandate that within one year having every single one of our permits digital. So they're converting it right now. So if someone came in and said, I want to drill a well, there would be every effort to make sure everything is captured in terms of the digital form so that it could be quickly rotated around to all the other divisions for them to make pass on what is okay with this, okay with this, okay, that's part of the process. Okay. So that's going to capture what I uh, what they want to do. Right? That's correct. Okay, now is there going to be a back end where once that well has been drilled, okay, it is the well is here, it is this deep, it is completed on this day, it is screened here. The water's up and on and on and on. Now that's the, the well, that's what I'm talking about. The completion report. The completion report. The completion no, report. Actually, that's a drilling report. The completion report is actually when you do the completion, which is when they do the fracking. That's an industry term, right? Not a, a technical term. So you have to be very, very careful. Right. About the oh, okay. When you when you complete a water well, when you what are you what are you saying? You want to use the word? Uh, let's see. There's, in Virginia, there's a drilling report that's turned in, which is at the end of the drilling process. Completion, even though we conversationally talk about the well being completed, is a totally different process. Completion is actually when the well is fracked and then when it is put into production. And so the industry term of a completion report is very different than you and I conversationally talking about okay. the completion process of the well being right. completed. Well, for yeah. the purposes of what I'm asking you now, whether it's, again, the Zone, whatever, or when it's fresh. In Virginia, they'll turn in a, a, a drilling report that has all those components on it, and that completion report is actually the, 
the detailed things of, of when they practice as far as the zones that they practice. Okay. But, but those You're those talking about yeah, the water, the fishery well, coordination, I'm talking about the well, well, case and size, everything like that. Well, close, well, whatever, whether the zone nuances as to what type it is. Whenever that well generally is finished mm -hmm. and that initial data collection that is, is done, and we will include that for our conversation, mm -hmm. that information, okay? Water wells have a similar thing if there's an actor test done. A lot of times the well is real, it's built, it's logged, it's screened, but the actor test or pump test may be done in six months from now. Mm -hmm. but, but, but once all that information is done, that's what I'm talking about is there at the point where the driller goes in and, and puts all that in to a internet web base database right from where it's generated. So I understand what you said. You said that there's some plans to try to do that. Ken, you said it's going to be automated, like the upfront, the permit, okay, you want to drill this well here. Well, that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, well, I'm, again, I'm talking about on the back end. So on the back end in North Carolina, we call it a completion report. Okay. Because oil and gas is so rare in our state for that. So it's like uh, it, it, it will be after you get oil and gas rules, it'll be completion report will be after you you've done the fracking and all like that, a lot of simulation stuff. So, you know, a well drilling report is basically the daily report of how you drill the well and how many hours and stuff like that and how far that you went and where the screen all that went. So those are gonna be captured. The key thing is is that that's submitted typically not digitally because they want the actual paper that were actually handed in from that driller to say this is what I did as opposed to somebody else. Some other person is going online and entering in information there. Those are two different licenses yeah. type that. But, but they're not that. Okay. okay. All right. Now, here's the next question. Does anybody know anybody in the, in the, in the country that after a well is done, that the driller sits down at their laptop at their office and says this is the completion of blah, 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 where it's, they're doing it online and it's going straight into some database anywhere in the country? Beta testing. Okay. And it had things, uh, checks and balances, so that way the driller put in and the screen sure. was deeper than the actual depth, it would take it back sure. and say this number is wrong. Right. And so that's how the quality control could have handled okay. that logic. Anyway, where, where I'm going with this, so it doesn't look like anybody knows it. I think you should probably speak with Dana Wani um, and people with the Yeah, he might be able to have it. He might be able to, he might be on the website. So, I, I don't know if no, he's going to have it. Let me, let me well, go where I'm going. Let me, let's just start where we're going. Rough back on all of calculation since 1900, at least 2 million wells have been drilled in Virginia. At least 2 million. Okay? And plus or minus whatever. And our database, the people who work very hard taking our database and y'all's data and whatever we come up with. How many? 40,000? Okay, so we've got some kind of information on 40,000 of at least 2 million, and it could be 4 million since 1900, <laughs> whole drilled in Virginia, okay? <clears throat> One thing that is taking time and, and thousands of hours here is to got to go to some paper this or some paper that, okay? Mm -hmm. We've got us today, mission one, for 50 years from now, or 100 years from now, they're all going to go back to this effort here. One day, there's going to be people meeting up 50 years from now talking about what we're talking about. And there's no reason that 50 years from now, we've got 50 years of every state, every time a driller does a well, that they sit down and they, they you know, the drillers in Virginia have cell phones that are smarter than mine. And stand on that well and read the you know, GPS that long or how well. So the reason I like this conversation for our process here in this discussion of sustainability is also, you know, it shifts the onus of who's putting in the data, right? I mean, right now we've, like you said, spent how many countless man hours going through uh, paper records and regulatory agencies and things? Well, this would then shift the onus from us as the state geological survey, the regulatory agency, whomever it is, to the actual person that's completing the well. And so, you know, how, how is there a way that we can maybe push towards that? That might be an 
another option for sustainability, right? Is yeah, that not, yeah, the, not that we the, can. Not that we can. We have to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's, um, it's done by each state to state. That's and it is done by state to state. It's such a huge fracking because they have no water level regulations and they can't pass it because of that. That's why we have issues. Other states are well ahead. I'm, I'm pretty sure your answer, I know like Iowa, some of those big agricultural states with water, big business out there, they have very developed well record programs. I bet you there are states that do so. Okay. Well, okay. Not even that. Illinois has and then we've argued that the Independent Republic of Texas has, they have a, you know, with the Red Pictor Commission, they, they have all the gas and oil wells taken care of since 1903. But the key thing is, is that water's not under their purview in the Texas River Commission. So we've got to do over in some Texas departments and environmental law or something like that. It's like, okay, what they do, I have no personal idea. Well, the, I'm just saying for, for longevity of this, Absolutely. The there's no reason that, that next week or next month or next year that if everyone understands just the fundamental need mm -hmm. to capture that well information right when it's born, like in a, a birth certificate, okay? That then not enter the birth certificate into a system in each state. So well, all of this is, is done. And then we all we have to do is figure out where we want to leak it or send it or use it. Well, and that's it, the easy to... part, you know, making the, the script that translates one header to another, that's the easy part. But, yeah, you're absolutely right in that. Like I said, the reason I like this conversation for this session is that it talks about uh, shifting the onus, but also getting in additional end users, getting, getting those end users to buy into the system. Again, ownership. And it's, yeah, it's not ownership. just as simple as this so, either because right. it's in the beginning Academy Bill's paper and required it, but Joe had not issued for it. But it took years of my on the board trying to soothe them into saying adding more geologic data information. Because just putting a header and saying there's a well there doesn't do a whole doesn't do that right. It's got to have information about the depth, the clinical rock, how much casing, et cetera. And even you know, you can kind of uh, indirectly infer some of this information, like you figure out how the bedrock where the casing is a proxy. <laughs> so you want to make sure that you're capturing your data. And if you want, I've got an article I wrote for the Water Well Journal that talked about exactly this, the logic and why killers should do this, and I can get you a copy of it. I think I'm about out of time. So in conclusion, <laughs> take this back, think about it, call me next week. I'll be in the office all week. Email me. Please send me your ideas. You know, as, as you saw, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. And we need input and ideas on how to resolve some of those. So um, let me know. And <laughs> anything online before we bow up? Anyone have questions or comments? Before Silence from one working. Thank you, Kim. Well, I think that last discussion actually hit <laughs> In the workshop, and that is some other potential sources of geothermal well data. And the water well uh, data set is obviously a place to start. There's a lot of water wells being drilled. So I suggest that we're, we take a 15 minute break. How about 10 minutes? Is that all right? 10 minutes? 10 minute break, which would bring us to about 20 after, uh, 20 after 2. And we'll come back and start with that. And can I just say before I want to start to this, um, we have been taking photos, we have to notice that one of our interns, our native back here, has been taking photos. I want to make sure that we have everyone's permission to put images of your face on perhaps our state challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and also, for those of you who give presentations, would we have your permission to add that on our state survey? website, you know, advertising the geothermal project and what we've done and et cetera, et cetera. If any of you do not wish for your presentation to be made public, please let me know. And then finally, just to remind you guys that we have the evaluation sheet kind of survey, please just remember to fill that out. Good. 
Oh, no, they were there. I think they might have been there. No, I think they were there. They were no, I didn't see any right. 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 This for free. Do what for free? This thing for free. Which thing? This thing. That's my job. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying.